All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, again, uh, well, know you all, but for those who, who are all here, I'm Delonte Spencer Thomas. I serve as the Chief Ethics Officer for the City of Cleveland, uh, and I bring you greetings from, from the Mayor's Office uh, and on behalf of the City Administration. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone for the, the first installment, the orientation for the new Community Police Commission. Um, and so, so we have a really tight, uh, jam-packed agenda today. Um, and so uh, lots of different things that we're going to go through. But again, as we described, this session is a, a overview, right? It's to give you guys uh, insight. We've been, uh, we've delivered lots of information to you. This is an opportunity for you to ask questions, for you to get, um, to, to start to get an understanding of what your role will be as new uh, community police member, uh, community police commissioners. Um, also, this is an opportunity to, to introduce you to a number of key stakeholders um, in this effort, right? So this is, this is a, collective, uh, a collective agenda that, that we're all working towards, and the CPC is just a piece of that. And so, so this is an opportunity to also be able to, to engage, uh, not just with each other, but also with stakeholders in this space. And so, so again, um, Delonte also uh, introduced Jason Goodrick, Administrative Manager for the Community Police Commission. And so between the two of us, uh, we'll lead today's discussion um, before we turn things over uh, to, to, to you guys. So, so that being said, before we get started, I uh, just want to officially and formally call the roll for, for the first meeting of the Community Police Commission. All right? All right James Shura. Present. Charles Donaldson, Jr. Present. Kyle Early. Present. Kate Kennedy. Present. Gregory Reeves. Present. Jan Ridgway. Present. Pete Van Leer. Present. Terry Wong. Present. Sharina Zayed. Present. John Adams. Chandra Benito, Adriana Rodriguez, Present. Alana Garrett Ferguson. We have a quorum and we will get started with, with today's meeting. So again, without further ado, I want to introduce Jason Goodrick, Administrative Manager. Okay, welcome everybody. This is uh, your office. This is where the CPC has operated out of for the better part of the last five years, 3631 Perkins Avenue. Um, this office is open to all of you all the time, as well as the public. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about myself and the staffing uh, after you hear from some other speakers. Um, so this is the third iteration of the police commission that I've been a part of. My uh, initial working title was executive director, but the law has changed. So right now, I currently can't hold that title under 115. Uh, any longer and my civil service position is administrative manager so I run the day-to-day -day operations here at the CPC and I've been doing that for uh, June will be my six-year anniversary um, one of the things that we found successful um, with the Commission that the first Commission that came from the consent decree in 2015 did not have is a formal orientation um, and a way to kick that off um, what we did in 2019 that worked really well is just take a few minutes up front for you all to get to know each other, kind of do an icebreaker exercise, a little team building. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a tremendous amount of time on that. But what we're going to try to get to is throw out a little bit of shared values and shared vision as a group so you guys have a, a foundation to come back to. And what we'll use, uh, what we capture from this exercise, we'll use uh, in future trainings to build towards some core value pillars for the group, a mission statement for the group, you know, those kind of things. So this will just be a real quick exercise to get to know each other, see what your values are, and find some common ground between you all. Um, so on the back of your agenda, you'll find three questions. And what I'm going to ask you to do is pair up with someone who you'd like to get to know or you haven't had a lot of conversation with yet, right? So don't gravitate towards a person you've been talking to for two weeks. Okay. Try and find someone that uh, you haven't really had a chance to get to know yet. Uh, if you have to shuffle around, we'll give you a minute to do that. And what we're going to do is you guys in, in pairs are going to ask each other three questions. And at the end of those three questions, you're going to do a little presentation. You're going to introduce the person you're with instead of them introducing themselves. Okay? And then you're going to jump into what you've learned about them and then your shared uh, values that you came up with. Um, so one to two key point strengths about the person that you're interviewing, find out, right, that they think will be valuable to this group. Um, Board experience success, the question's a little bit longer on the paper, but in the interest of time, 
what we're going to do instead of sharing a story about a board that was successful that you've been on because that takes a little bit of time what we're going to do is just shorten that question to have you served on a successful board or team you ask your partner that and if they answer yes then you kind of ask them what were some of the things that made that team successful what were their values and then I want you to take a minute as a group I think we have an odd number right now so when you have to be three person team and that's fine um, and just kind of take a moment to envision 2027, right? So some of you will have been here for four years. Um, and those of you who are on two-year terms, you might have re-upped and come back uh, for, this, for the second term, right? Uh, what does that look like? What have you accomplished? Just some general ideas off the top of your mind, right? So without uh, wasting too much time, we're going to jump right into that. Um, and we're going to stay strict here. So about 15 minutes in, in the conversation question part. And then we'll come back and do 15 minutes of report outs, okay? So I would say integrity and my bridge. Building. That's great. Yeah. What? Maybe you can do me first, and I'll come back to you. Okay. Okay. Um, what about the boards that you've served on? Um, so I currently serve on the Hunger Network board. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do uh, advocacy and political uh, activism. Um, and it's been successful just because of. Uh, I'm actually on a board where I'm uh, passionate, so it's easier to serve when you're serving your passion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's been a great experience. Excellent. So, what what makes the board successful to you? Um, the diversity of the board. Yeah. yeah. The diversity of the board. And uh, respecting what everybody brings in terms of their skill sets mm -hmm. and values. And so, uh, Okay, your vision for 2027. Um, I would say the biggest thing is I want those who fought for this issue to so be happy with the work that we are That's that's my my so share with me. I'm So, the finder is Oh, yeah, the finder is. That is very tenacious. I'm very good at converting. So, the first thing you got to do is that much time. On the back of your agenda. And secondly, I'm very strategic. Right. So right. you tell I'm me able to think far ahead team, and uh, figure out where all the puzzle pieces uh, kind of need to go to get, get out there. Okay. Um, a couple so, things. Trying to go. Is it safe to say forward thinking? Think, yeah. I'm very much a thinker. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I can tell that about you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very much have you started on the board? I have. Okay. Um, 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 the person that made it successful was, um, I think I did some expertise in social work and 
So, okay. So when we introduce ourselves, I'm going to introduce you and you introduce me. So we got to rank these. Uh, so I'm sure. How about you? Uh, me? Um, I think I'm a great community. I think I can actually take anybody because I love people so much. I study people. I think I can fit in anywhere. And, and two, uh, I'm going to have to listen to you. I'm going to listen to you to myself. Yeah. Would you like to see the jump in this text message um, email so bad? <laughs> I would like for us to be successful to the point that we're the model. Okay. I ain't gonna waste a lot of time on that. The second one, I broke my reading glasses too. So. Oh no. Now you just look like you're in the office. Right. <laughs> Each person shared a very brief story about who you served on the board. Okay, this is basically you said, if you have you ever been on a successful tour and what made it successful? So, I used to live in Larchmore. Um, um, I've never served on the board. I've um, been on a successful team I'm in, in sports and in life. Um, yeah. Brief story I'll tell you is that I was a monitor in the shelter. And I saw a need for being in the to work every day. And they come home too late to get a bed. Yeah. I thought that that was a thing. They needed to start asking my school. Can I say, yeah. can you bed for these guys in the morning? He did. Um, no, so one day, he was following okay, cool. around the section. section. And now I'm telling you, he's settled the mind and the sections for different needs because of that. Cool. I love that. I love that. Um, so we've been on a border team in a country. Um, so I think um, one example when I was out of shore, all the shelter stores were working at a domestic violence shelter. Mm -hmm. And I was on our um, like DEI committee. And I think this was one of the most effective DEI committees. Yeah, like the breakdown team. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I definitely don't like to overcommit. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I can be that green. Between those two. Green star. I think this will be very successful. I think. I wanted to think, so what do I envision? I think that a successful commission has accomplished the creation of new solutions that we have in I think there's a lot of, you know, yes, we need trust, yes, we need like all different meetings, but new, new programs, new policies. I think that we have a diverse group. Maybe things that aren't even being done in this but that could actually create About five minutes, and then we're going to do the report out. This is why my experience, the things I'm thinking about the chart, they sound simple, but it's way more complex. Like, yeah, I'm trying to have communication better so that people can really work too deeply. You know what I mean? Like, if I. What else is all I'm going to do? You want to be a white person? Yeah. I want to be a white person. 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 I got older and actually started having to deal with them in real life. <laughs> of course, they changed. And I felt much more defending victims. Not just a police officer. I think the core thing that you're advocating for people wanting to help people and then wanting to have fun with me. I think the one of the biggest things is. No, I've got to just lost my train of thought. Yeah. Sorry, that was... No, that's what yeah, you know, it was. I'm just thinking about too many things. Wow. Well, so many different things I would like to see done. You know, one thing that we do is that we're in New Hampshire. It's very different. It's very different from Cleveland. And then after that, I lived in L.A. Oh, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, this is city. Why can't some people have maybe have a better job? It's not a Why can't they be happy? Oh, yeah. 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 I know that's, that's, that's a lot because in Ohio, people are telling me you can't get home until you can't have a car. But there are ways around it. I know people are telling me legally have to get a jump in the zoo. So you can increase the number of things. Maybe we need to help people get over that barrier and allow them to apply. Frankfurt. Just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll say that. That would be sad. Like you said, I've got to try some things that haven't been tried before. Because whatever it was, probably, obviously, or hasn't worked. Has it accomplished what? Even though I didn't say anything, I'll probably not get close to it. I guess it was like, I'm more of a homicide type of thing. Thank you.
Just about two more minutes, we're going to wrap it up. All right. I'm enjoying this, but I would enjoy it even more. So we're going to just uh, go around the table, start this way with your groups, and uh, you can take turns introducing each other and then sharing your uh, vision for 2027. Okay? Should they pass the mic for the sound? Or will they pick it up on the tables? Yeah, they just make sure they turn their microphones on. Okay. Oh. And then turn it back off when they're not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you could kind of share the mics. Perfect. Yep. Oh, don't go too far. Oh, that's right. Over. So okay, to turn, like turn them on, we just uh, hit this button and they go green, and then there you go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, I can. <laughs> Do I need to introduce her and everything? Or? Yep, you introduce the person that you were in a group with. Don't introduce yourself. And then right. go through your values, your personal values, your uh, the team-based values you came up with, and then your vision for 2027. So, something, make sure I'm saying your name right. Sandra Benito. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as far as she, one of her strengths, she's a team player, which I can attest to from having conversations with her before. She's definitely that. And she has a lot of experience in social work and mental health. Um, for the second one, as far as the board, uh, she worked at a domestic violence shelter where 
DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, she was able to show the importance of having uh, interpreters as far as Spanish and also sign language, which is phenomenal. That's very important. And lastly, vision for 2027. She said, we need to come up with things that haven't been tried before. Um, thinking outside of the box. Trying new things. That's it. Um, I don't know. Let's go reach that far. Sorry, I was a little bit late. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Um, I also just want to make a quick request. So I'm hard of hearing. I use hearing aids. And um, with the masks, it can sometimes be a little bit harder for me to hear. So if everyone, because I read lips. So if everyone could just try to project your lovely voices. Um, I was uh, very lucky to get to talk more with, do you go by Greg or Gregory? Greg. Greg, okay, yeah. with, with <laughs> Mr. Gregory. And um, some of the strengths that he identified, which I can also attest to from even just the short time that we've known each other, is that he's a great communicator and he really invests a lot in communication with people um, because he says that he loves people so much. And um, I really see that in Gregory. I think that's one of the biggest things that I see driving you. And then the second one was also being a great listener. And always trying to take that time to step back and listen before necessarily responding. Um, some of the, um, uh, Greg shared a story with me about working at a homeless shelter and identifying that there was a group of uh, men who uh, were working and then they would get back from work late past the deadline to get a bed. And so they would end up losing their beds. And he felt like, but that wasn't really fair. Um, and so he helped develop a program that for folks who were working, that there would be some beds set aside um, for them. And um, from that, we kind of talked about the, the values and traits that we saw um, in that team effort that he led uh, was, you know, really listening to the needs of people uh, and uh, collaborating um, with leadership. Um, and with different stakeholders to, to um, you know, to be able to implement something and implement something so that that continues even if Greg leaves where he's working um, or where he was. And then um, also um, talked about really um, advocacy and, and, and being a strong advocate for people. Uh, the, in talking about envisioning the future, um, uh, Greg talked about really wanting us to be a board that, that listens to people, that is uh, a bridge between people, um, and that, you know, the vision for 2027 is that we um, live in a community where public safety is based on compassion and understanding. So thank you, Greg, for sharing all that thank with you. me. Thank you. Thank you. So the individual that I have to my right, his name is Charles Donaldson Jr. He is an observer and he listens. Um, he asks the necessary questions and he's looking to make an impact and he likes to make a difference. Um, he has been working in HR for seven years. Some of his uh, experiences include for advocating for student voices as an RA, and um, just working as a recruiter, he, tons, he talks to tons of people, which allows him to get diversity of perspectives. Um, um, what he hopes to accomplish is turning concerns into action and really being a voice for the community. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I have Adriana Rodriguez to introduce uh, some of our values include relationship building and just being very meticulous when it comes to her work. So she's very detail oriented and she pays attention to that because of her role. Uh, she is currently a family advocate and she talks to families and organizations throughout the city and she actually has a caseload of over 100 families. So she's constantly getting out there and learning about the, uh, the needs and the concerns that people have within our communities. Uh, she has experience in homelessness domestic violence and also employment issues. And she really understands the underlying needs of Cleveland and that's what she could bring to the commission. Uh, she also has work in data-driven framework. 
uh, which will be important to our commission. And her goal is for the, the commission to make informative decisions and also implement effective policies. <laughs> so it was a pleasure getting to talk to Joe Chura. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jim, I'm sorry, I want to call you Joe, forgive me. Uh, Jim Chura, um, he is, he worked with the police department 33 years uh, and um, has been uh, more on, he's done a lot with the, in, in the area of leadership. I think what he brings to this commission uh, will be an objective perspective as we work through uh, assignments. He also brings a very analytical uh, background. He has been an investigator, so I think that that experience will be valuable to the committee. <coughs> in fact, he has participated in lots of uh, committees. Uh, I think the one experience that he shared that kind of struck home with me was uh, an event that he went to on the east side where there were kids from, you know, from, from the community and there were lots of resources for kids there uh, from all, from social services, from the educational community. So he got a chance to see a lot of this up close and personal. He has a four year assignment um, and what he would like to see uh, in uh, in 20, what is that, 2027, is that we have been fair and objective in the work that we do, that we have made informed decisions, and that we have kept politics out of it. So, Jeff, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm introducing <laughs> Jan Ridwick. Uh, she has three strengths she brings to the com committee. Community engagement, board experience, and she said age experience, we're going to call it life experience. <laughs> uh, with community engagement, she serves on, uh, uh, she's at service 13 agencies this week with the approximate time of two hours at each agency. She tries to get the needs of the community to the resources that are available and match them up to help out people. She's worked in Hoff and Glenville extensively. She uh, just did a, uh, a little ride along with uh, nurses that are graduating from Case Western Reserve University. Took them to different parts of the community so they could try to encourage them to stay in our community mm -hmm. and work here in Cleveland. Uh, she's been on um, board experience. She's been on 20 boards, um, guiding and reviewing. The, the most ones, the biggest one she said was in um, Alaska with the libraries and it was like, a I don't know how long it took, it was three, three, years, years. three years to get this thing through, and she looked at everything from, she was the only woman on this board, and she looked at everything from furniture to building uh, codes and all that. Um, life experience, obviously she's, she has a lot of life experience, um, which we all bring, you know, different, different, different facets to this, uh, this board. Her um, achievements, I think she said, would working with dancing wheels, which is um, dancing in wheelchairs, and matching up them with uh, certain things. He mentioned Alzheimer's. Um, and what, like I said before, with the Alaska the building, with that headquarters, it was all about libraries. And I think in uh, 2027, she wants to see improved relationship with the police, and she also wants to see confidence in the community towards us on this board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're welcome. And I couldn't think of her last name, to be fair, if you got my first I couldn't think of her last name. So. We wrote it down. <laughs> Hello, I had the pleasure of speaking with John Adams. And I just want to say thank you, John, for being so open and transparent. Um, I had a great time talking with you and getting to know you a little bit. Um, so the strengths that John possesses that I believe will be a great asset to this commission is he's empathetic. He has the ability to see things from various perspectives. He's extremely transparent and he's committed to doing what's right. Um, he shared with me a story of a time he was successful on a team. Um, he was a part of several school startups. 
Um, he helped start one of the first charter schools inside of a juvenile detention center. Um, though challenging, everyone was committed and stepped up using their individual strengths to see their shared vision succeed. They collective, collectively worked toward the shared goal that, and they made the school a place where young people wanted to attend daily. Um, in John's own words, I'm really proud of the work we did. And, I, and we could tell by the, by the success of the school and kids wanting to go there. So for the future, success to him, success would be um, the commission remaining independent. It's crucial to our mission that our decisions are our own. He stated that um, he would like to see a cultural shift in the community between citizens and the police department. And he would like to see um, the divide bridged and tr more trust created between citizens and the police officers. Um, stop infighting and um, create non-adversarial relationships between the commission, citizens, and its officers. Thanks, John. Thank you. So I had the pleasure of talking to Serena Zayed. Did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think she's going to be a great asset to the commission um, because she has a lot of qualities that I think um, will help us. Um, she's empathetic. Um, one of the things that she did was she actually asked a few, like a, a, a boss and a, a couple friends, if they, what they would say about her, and uh, resilience and flexibility, reliability seem to be like common just with the people that she asked. So she mm -hmm. clearly has those qualities. Um, she's mission driven, she's devoted to the community, um, and she says that she has um, good values. And one of the other qualities that she possesses is that she um, chooses to see positive in other people. So I think um, that those are all great qualities um, that will help us um, in especially maybe some more difficult times because we'll need that type of energy in the room. Um, her, um, about the second question regarding being on the board or part of a group, um, she talked about the violence interruption program, um, Stop the Pain, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, she said she was pretty much there from the start, and she was there to support the executive director, and oftentimes they spent their own money um, to help push the organization forward, um, and, and, and a group in particular they were concerned about that they worked closely with were the mothers um, of who lost children and they really try to create a support group for them um, and they went to their homes and Sharina said that the women found um, the strength and the purpose for their pain. Um, so again, I think that's her empathy that she talked about before. Um, and then she says like she's currently on the board and that um, what helps keep them together is a shared passion um, and that it is critical to their success. Um, and so all of their individual experiences, she says, helped the group jail um, and that what they had was a shared value um, for life and that that motivated <coughs> them to succeed. So I just feel like, you know, there's a real good heart inside of there. Um, and then lastly, in terms of uh, her, what she'd like to see in 2027, um, she said the number one thing is that she would like to see a Cleveland Police Department um, that practice cons practices constitutional policing. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty powerful um, mm -hmm. and you know succinct. Um, clearly she loved to see a decrease in violence and a decrease in juvenile crimes. Um, and she would want to see um, successful wellness programs for officers um, as well. And mm -hmm. um, she wants Cleveland to be a place where police officers want to come and work. Um, and then she said um, she would like to see a fully staffed Cleveland Police Department and that Cleveland would become a model for other cities. Um, and then lastly, like some more uh, community outreach engagement programs with officers. So those were her um, provisions. Uh, do you want to start? Or you... Um, so we, we had, um... We're not going to go individually because we had three, or we almost had four. So um, to, in the, in the, in the um, and, we had three. Oh no, well, we, before you, before were here, you we came. Had, yeah. 
Um, so I think we'll just we'll just talk <laughs> simultaneously. It's okay. My name is Terry Wong. This is Pete Van Leer and uh, Gary Person. So uh, Pete, um, I think the skills that he brings are he's been he's worked for decades in coalitions, and though he didn't say it explicitly, I'm sure those were coalitions with a lot of different ideas, a lot of different people. Um, so he has that experience working with tangibly with people that are actually very different and building consensus that way. He also has um, a lot of policy experience, so he's able to explain to us some of the structural and external um, circumstances that may be very important for us to take into account um, when making um, decisions and understanding our path forward. Um, what were your values? Do you want? I didn't write them down. Oh, no. he didn't write them down. <laughs> but I think I think he, uh, you know, uh, I think he's very passionate about being fair and building consensus mm -hmm. and including everybody. Uh, we can see that um, you know he, he helped get all 13 of us in the room today. Um, and his um, vision. Should we just go? Sure. The, yeah. yeah, I can talk about. Yeah. You know, Terry talked about her um, authenticity and just feeling like giving other opportunities to be authentic and being very tolerant of difference <laughs> among people. So realizing there's ideology, but there may be differences there, but there's humanity, shared humanity, and so works hard to make sure people feel heard. Um, it also brings a creative artist, artistic, art, aesthetic skill to, to the work of thinking creatively about things. And I think that resonated with Alana too. You kind of um, chimed in on that. But um, you also talked about your community organizing, your work as a poli in policy as well, and um, your um, commitment as an abolitionist. Um, so, I don't know, that's, that was um, sort of that first set of questions. Um, it was kind of hard to like, because since there were three of us, it was a little bit difficult to sort of sp split it all up. So, I think you had talked about serving on a successful board or team, and um, there's, you know, there was a commitment to the work and recognizing that, you know, people doing what they say they're going to do and just letting, you know, not getting caught up in that was you, right? Personal feelings and just like mm -hmm. um, really just really committing to the work and everybody brings strength to it. Um, so that was one thing that you had said about that. I don't know, what am I missing here? I think we talked about trusting people, you know, to yeah. do the best that they can and knowing that we can't do it singly, but we have to work together. Um, and um, our vision, I guess we can move on to. Yeah, unless you had something else to add. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we talked about, um, in terms of the commission not being static and being able to change as we, as we evolve, as we develop, and that we're fair and that we really represent the community, and that, um, that we've impacted policing, that it's more just, uh, there's more accountability, um, and that pe police and the community understand why there is a consent decree, consent decree here. And um, that, that understanding has increased, especially among the police. Um, and that we can really work to, we've really helped um, and continue to reimagine public safety in, in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to add that I think when I was thinking about all this, um, maybe a simple way of saying is that because you know I'm an immigrant, I maybe through that experience, I had to move a lot, move across the entire sea. I think all of us are looking for this place that we call Cleveland to be home. And that really means um, all the things of home, that we are safe, that we can return safely, we can have peace, and we can be seen and heard. So that's my hope for the future, and hopefully everybody else's. Yeah. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce Pastor Kyle Early. He is a man of integrity, and he also considers himself a bridge builder, two very important qualities that will serve us well here in the commission. He has served on numerous boards and committees, and the values that made those groups successful were the diversity of each group and the respect for one another. And finally, Kyle's vision for the future is, for 2027, his goal is that those who fought to push Issue 24 
across the finish line are pleased with the work that we are doing. I'm introducing Kay Kennedy, who is tenacious. Um, she says she can turn any no into yes. <laughs> so that'll be good for us. Uh, <laughs> um, and she is strategic and a forward thinker. Um, she has served on a few boards, and what has made those boards successful is alignment with shared values and goals. Um, and what would make us successful in 2027, we, become, we will become the model for other cities and police departments around the country. Okay. So thank you all for taking a few minutes just to do a little team building. Okay, we don't have to uh, go into all this today or recap it, but what I will do is consolidate it into a document that I'll send out where you can see how much you have in common, you know, how much values you share, what strengths you guys have as a team, as a group, right? So all that will be important as we go forward and we're looking for kind of a North Star to look back to. We can come back to these words and say, look at all the things we wanted to achieve by 2027. Uh, unfortunately, that's a lot of work on that board when you look at what you want to achieve. Um, so now we're going to get into the, uh, the grid of it here. Um, before I introduce our next guests, I'll let uh, Delante do that on the agenda. I do want to say a couple housekeeping things. You know, we're not in uh, grade school, so if you need to get up, if you need to take a break, if you need to move, feel free. There's restroom keys at the front there. Uh, we'd be happy to show you the women's restroom is on this floor. Uh, the men's, you have to go down a floor to access. There's also refreshments over there since this is a working, you know, we ask you to come in on your, on your time when you would normally be having a meal. So we do have some light refreshments over there too. Feel free to get up, stretch your legs, get a refreshment. Okay. Delante. All right. So in keeping things moving along, um, so you guys have had a lot of opportunity to, to hear from me. <laughs> um, you know, we, we've been in constant communication for, for, for months now. But, um, but we wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity, especially here on, on day one uh, of the, you guys being gathered, to, to be introduced to, to other stakeholders, right? And to, to be able to start to um, engage with, with the community at, at large. And so um, that only not only includes here uh, the administration. So I do want to take uh, just a second just to point out and introduce um, some of my colleagues who have also been a part of the selection process for, for creating the commission. Um, Eden Genorio um, from our communications department. Uh, Hannah Macias, who's our public service fellow here in the law department. Um, Dr. Lee Anderson, who you'll meet shortly as well. Um, also recognize um, so our law director, Mark Griffin, who you've also met, swore, swore all of you in. Um, and so, so again, you've had the opportunity to meet from us, but, um, but now we wanted to make sure we introduced you to, to other leaders, um, both in and, and out of the city. Uh, so, so that being said, uh, I first want to introduce uh, Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway, um, who currently serves as the interim monitor so for, the, for the consent decree. So, so as all of you know, um, the city uh, entered into a settlement agreement in 2015 um, as a result of a Department of Justice investigation um, with respect to use of force and other issues uh, within our police department. And so, um, and so as a part of that process, the court assigns a monitor to essentially uh, watch over or, or the, the compliance uh, of that settlement agreement. And so, um, so I wanted you to have an opportunity to, to meet Professor Hardaway, um, and so I allow her to, to come up and uh, introduce herself. So, yeah. <coughs> So for the live stream, this is the, okay, the good this place to be. For the live stream. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to see. I watched um, you all's announcement on, on um, the step house uh, or the, the steps of, of the city hall and certainly the interviews, uh, the many, many rounds of interviews that it seemed like you all were uh, participating in. And so it is nice to be in a room with you uh, together. I uh, have been serving on the consent decree uh, as a member of the monitoring team since it started in 2015, so seven and a half years somehow. I have lots more gray hair and probably many more lines, um, but, but nonetheless, right, we're still here. And um, found myself in the position of serving in the interim monitor role when Hassan Aden 
uh, resigned uh, um, in at the end of October of, of last year. So um, I'm born and raised in the Cleveland area, uh, care so much about our community, found myself uh, serving um, at the request of the first monitor, Matthew Barge, um, um, <coughs> sort of unexpectedly in many, many ways. And I've learned so much about Cleveland, so much about policing, uh, and so much about the desire of um, our community to build and, and mend bridges uh, uh, as necessary through this process. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to serve uh, for the last seven and a half years. Uh, and um, I wanted just the opportunity to meet you guys. Number one, to say that um, the consent decree, the thing that was most exciting to me about the consent decree was the creation of the police commission. Um, that's the original consent decree. And even though section 115 passed um, uh, uh, and you all have far greater powers than the initial uh, uh, commission, um, there are still some requirements under the consent decree that the commission must fulfill, that the city has to ensure uh, uh, take place uh, in, order, in order to do that. And so there's a set of uh, monitors or members of the monitoring team. Many of you, I know you all know them, the local folks, Charles C., Victor Ruiz, Tim Tramble, uh, they've been on it since the start of this process with me as well. Um, and, and we look forward to working with you all much in the same way that we did with the original commission. There are certain provisions of the consent decree um, that require us to engage on an annual basis, at least, uh, maybe no, semi-annual, sorry, semi-annual basis, at least. Um, and so I really look forward to being available to you, to being a resource to you. Uh, the parties are going to choose a new head monitor soon, but that doesn't mean that I won't be a resource and available to you. Uh, and so I just thank you for your service. I know this is going to be a journey and probably a bit of a whirlwind um, for now, but it will settle. It will all come together soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there's anything so, else I needed um, to. So actually, uh, just one question. Oh, um, yeah. If you can just share. Yeah. Um, from from the court's perspective, uh, what's your expectation yeah. of the commission? Yeah. So the details of the expectation from from the monitor's perspective are, are can be found, and from the judge's perspective can be found in the section of the consent decree. Uh, and it's been amended, but nonetheless, I, I looked at it again today. There are some specific provisions for the commission in the, in the decree. Um, and so um, typically what that, what that means is, is that in my role as a monitor and with the local folks here that will um, participate in, in, in monitoring uh, the implementation of the provisions related to the to the consent to the CPC in the consent decree um, is that we will um, be hoping to find um, evidence, information, uh, proof that the CPC and the police department and the city are working in the way as intended um, when the parties agreed to the to the settlement agreement back in 2015. Right, so so we're sort of, and, and Judge Adrian, uh, oh Lord, Judge Oliver will say this from time to time. I must need to call him because uh, his name just popped out. Um, um, Judge Oliver will say often that that we serve as the eyes and ears of the court. Um, so, and and what that means is is that you know I, I listen and I and and I observe, uh, and then I, and then I talk with him. But then I typically don't say much outside of the details of what's in the consent decree and sort of what, in my best judgment, makes sense in terms of implementation without the court being aware of it, right? So people will say to me from time, oh, how are we doing? And I'll say, read our latest semi-annual report, right? <laughs> um, because, because it's inappropriate for me to um, make a formal statement on behalf of the judge without having first cleared that with him. And so we do all of that communication in open court with our semi-annual reports. Uh, one that will come out um, and we'll have, I don't know, some of you may have been at, at some of the status conferences, but we do a status conference every six months in front of the judge. Um, and, and that's with the parties, so the Department of Justice, the city, 
in the monitoring team. We do that um, every six months, and we also produce a publication that details how the city is doing in terms of the implementation of the decree, the status of various provisions on the implementation of the decree. Um, so, so I hope that that helps. It gets a little weird because people always want me to say more than what I'm able to say. Uh, and, and, and but if we all understand that my role is not, I don't represent the people will say, oh, she's DOJ. I am not the Department of Justice. I'm not uh, uh, an employee of the federal government. And I'm also not an employee of And I'm also not an employee of the city of Cleveland. Um, um, and, so, and so I really am serving as an independent, neutral um, party. And that's for the entire monitoring team. Yeah. Other questions? I forgot on the question piece. Yeah. Any other questions uh, to the interim monitor about her role, the court, consent decree? And, and again, as, as we explained, this certainly won't be the last time you'll have opportunity to be able to engage and ask questions and things like that. So. And you should feel free to email me um, if, if you want to sit down, have coffee. Um, what, I'm, I'm open to those types of communications and conversations. Just don't ask me for my assessment on anything. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and we'll be good. Okay. We look forward to working with you. Oh, thank you. I look for I look forward to working with you all too. I'm very, very, very excited about us being able to move forward in this space. There was, if you look at the former uh, semi-annual reports, you will note that um, there was considerable progress made by the former CPC, by the original CPC. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, there's a strong foundation there uh, that was built through that work. And so and so. At least you're not starting from ground zero, I guess that's what I want to say, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and your service. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you again to Professor Hardaway. Um, you know, it was, it was important to make sure that we made that introduction. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I've had to do um, on our, you know, many calls and, and the status conferences that, um, that Professor Hardaway uh, mentioned was, you know, the question always comes up. What's going on with the CPC? Are we ready yet? When did when they mean? What's going on? Right? I, I was starting to think she didn't believe this was happening. So I'm like, no, come on, come on here. We we got them here. We're ready to go. Right? So um, so so we wanted to make sure we made that introduction. Um, but as we are talking about consent decree, uh, next I'd like to introduce you guys to Dr. Lee Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is the executive director for the police accountability team. And so um, one of the ways in which we are working towards getting through uh, compliance with the consent decree is, is through implementation. And so, so one of the things that the mayor committed to uh, was creating an implementation structure to help us move that forward. And so uh, key to that is Dr. Anderson. So she comes to us from Chicago, uh, Illinois. Um, so I'll let her share a little bit more about her background. Um, but we're excited to have her here on board. So she's been here with the city uh, since November. Of, of last year, so so she's just getting her feet wet and getting started. But again, her role is, is certainly focused on uh, consent decree compliance, and so again, of course, that will touch um, or otherwise involve uh, the CPC. So, without further ado, Dr. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Chief Thomas. So it is a pleasure to be here. Um, again, my name is Dr. Lee Anderson, and I just want to say greetings and welcome. Um, I am the new executive director for the police accountability team and I just want to read a little statement that I prepared for you all today. Um, so my role is rooted in working with internal and external stakeholders to achieve successful implementation um, and compliance with the consent decree. In this role, I will assemble a team that will include professionals who are skilled in police procedure. Um, community engagement, data analysis, and the law of constitutional policing. I will also continue collaborating closely with City of Cleveland employees who have been assigned <laughs> to work on the consent decree since its inception. So my arrival is 
um, I would like to note that there are partners in the city that have been working on compliance with the consent decree and I will continue those relationships as I build out the police accountability team. Okay, uh, My day-to-day -day, day -day work excuse me, will include policy reviews, compliance updates, conducting performance audits and data analysis. The results of this work will inform recommendations for appropriate modifications to ensure best practices and move the city forward toward compliance and termination of the consent decree. Um, now here's the fun part, right? <laughs> like um, Professor Hardaway stated, um, I would like to note that even though the CPC is a separate and autonomous body from the, C from the city, the CPC is also covered by the consent decree in paragraphs 15 through 22, um, which I have brought for you today, little treats. <laughs> So this means that the police accountability team will be working closely together with the commission, okay, as we dedicate time and resources to achieve overall compliance and again, subsequent termination of the consent decree. The monitoring team, as Professor Hardaway stated, will be reviewing the commission's adherence to the consent decree and therefore I look forward to partnering with you as we work together to emerge from underneath the consent decree as a stronger city that stands on the tenets of constitutional policing community-led policing and trust-led policing. Congratulations on your appointments and let's get ready to work. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for, for Dr. Anderson? Great, again, congratulations and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> also within our, our uh, internal structure within the city, um, is, is certainly our, our Department of Public Safety, right? That, that houses our division of police. And so that's gonna be a crucial component uh, to, to working together. And, and we are all on the same page. We all want the same things. And so um, that said, we wanted to make sure I introduced you to Chief Director of the Department of Public Safety, Carrie Howard, um, who's with us. And, and um, you know, so Carrie's been in this role for, for a number of years now prior to uh, serving the city uh, as the Chief Prosecutor for the city as well. Um, so, so again, Carrie Howard. Hello everyone. First, welcome and congratulations on your appointment. I was um, on my way to a wedding in Akron when I was live streaming through the radio, <laughs> you're, you're swearing in. And uh, I, I heard the mayor go through each of your credentials and talk about you know each of you and, and who you are. And I too am very excited to work with you. Uh, I'm Carrie Howard, I'm the director of the Department of Public Safety. I'm the executive head of police, fire, EMS, animal care and control, um, the Bureau of Emergency Communications, which is comprised of emergency call takers and dispatchers from each of those divisions as well. Public safety is very, 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 very busy. Um, I bring along with me some experience that I have as a career prosecutor um, for the city of Cleveland, county prosecutor for Cuyahoga County. I'm a former assistant United States attorney. I'm a JAG officer in the Air Force Reserves. I deal with a lot of ethics and policy. Uh, in the Air Force as well. Um, my department is comprised of myself and four assistant directors. We oversee the operations um, for each of those divisions, the emergency management uh, for each of those divisions for uh, emergency responses. We do the administrative responsibilities, uh, making sure that people get paid and, and retirement pr is, is processed, and we make sure that the buildings and the fleet of each of the, uh, the divisions is, is maintained. So we will do a lot of working together, I'm sure, and I'm very excited about it. I'm here to help. I'm here to be a partner. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. If you want to email me, please feel free, and I'll give you my, my phone number as well. Um, there is a lot of lifting to do. There is, have been a lot of gains that have been made. Uh, my career, I have been dedicated to criminal justice reform. Coming over into public safety police reform is very important to me as well. Some of the things that we have done is we've done, uh, we've made changes in accountability, reporting and accountability. Um, policy review, um, looking at uh, and community engagement. Um, a few products that we've done in the last um, year is we've partnered with the food bank with officers uh, and firefighters giving out food, um, uh, partnering with schools for clap-ins and community fairs. There's a whole litany of things. I don't want to uh, do here and, and, and lay it all out, but you are, you are very much so needed. You're very much so welcomed, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions? Um, questions? Yeah. Uh, let's 
the departments that you currently or the direct sure. under your the divisions of police yes, again police oh i'm sorry police fire ems emergency medical services animal care and control and then there are uh, and corrections I, I i did forget corrections right so we have two staff members who oversee the the administrative process with the uh, with the county jail who houses um, arrestees. Uh, so and then there, within those divisions, there's like you know, there's smaller things: the traffic unit, bureau of communications, things that I've talked about, fire uh, prevention bureau. So there's other smaller operations within each of those divisions. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I didn't hear corrections before. I wondered if that was under your. I get my hand slapped all the time because I can get up there and say it, and I'll either forget corrections <coughs> or animal care and control, and those are all very important. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you, sir. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you know, so so again, and, and we will uh, continue to to create opportunities to you know for you guys to be able to have these conversations and more. And 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 we certainly didn't forget to you know highlight and, and focus or kind of laser focus on our division of police. And so, um, as some of the materials that that we've sent you previously. Um, the academy staff within the division of police, um, you know, have prepared and are continuing to to outline, um, you know, that that formal training piece that will begin to map out and, and put into uh, and put into play. And so, uh, during those sessions, you will have an opportunity to be able to be more um, of the division of police specifically. Okay. Um, so uh, that's it. So any any questions so far? Okay. When, when are we going to talk more about this training proposal that was put together? Is that, when will that be presented? Yeah. So no, no. Good question. Um, so so some of that some of that will happen before we leave here today, towards the end of today's session, right? So a lot of it will be based on on scheduling and in terms of um, how we can plug in things on on an ongoing basis. Um, and so so yes, we will continue to have that conversation today. Other other questions? Okay. What are you talking about you get like, you know, just a chart of how all the departments are related in the city and then your office of professional services? I don't know if that's in public safety or professional services. So Gotcha, gotcha. Good question. Yes, we can absolutely um, provide provide that context to that specific question. Um, so our Office of Professional Standards is an office um, that conducts investigations um, for allegations of misconduct within the police department. Um, previously, it housed under the Department of Public Safety. But one of the things, in addition to creating the CPC, one of the things that Charter Amendment 115 did was remove the Office of Professional Standards from under the Department of Public Safety, and they now report to the Civilian Personnel Review Board, which is a separate independent body. So now that that office reports up through the CPRB. Okay. But yes, we can absolutely provide, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll create a matrix of a uh, diagram in terms of all the different department structures and how, how they all work together, absolutely. You know, and, and some of it in, in full transparency, right? Some of it will be, uh, we are working together to figure out how some of the lines of communication will work, right? So one of the things that Charter Amendment 115 did is, again, created this permanent CPC structure, but also um, moved around some things within the Department of Public Safety, right? And so uh, we'll all need to, to work together to, to figure out how each of the respective entities will communicate with, the, with each other, who the key players are, et cetera. Um, so the, the CPRB is also excited to be able to, to work with you as well. Um, so again, we'll make sure that, that we facilitate and, and get, that, get that to you guys as well. Okay. Um, any, any other questions so far? Okay. So, so one of the things that, that I want to emphasize in, in talking about Section 115 of the Charter Amendment is that this commission exists to respond to needs and concerns of the community. Right, that's, that's the overall mission here, right? So, so yes, there is a laundry list of, of duties and responsibilities, um, but the goal is the same with each and every single one of them, and that's, and that's community driven, right? Making sure that this commission is responding to the needs of the community. 
Um, and so, so that's something that you want to make sure is, is driving uh, decision-making process um, and, and all the different things that you're going to be doing. So whether that's um, your community engagement piece, right? How you interact in the different districts, um, you know, what's your mechanism for receiving community input, right? And so we have, um, you know, so, so, and there are specific things, right? So when we talk about community first and highlighting some of the key points that are um, explicitly mentioned in section 115, right? And so it includes engaging in community outreach, um, maintaining connections and collaborate or collaborating with disenfranchised communities, um, eliciting public comment on, on police policy issues, right? And so, um, and then of course the, the, the grant, right? So the grant making authority um, is, is community based, right? So for violence prevention programming and, and, and other initiatives that, that support um, that support the mission of, of not just the commission, but overall what we're doing uh, with respect to police reform in the city. And so, um, so I, I want to make sure that that that's emphasized as much as possible, right? That this that this is about community. This is about getting the input from the community, right? So it's not only your voices, right? But making sure that you're responsible for gathering the voice of everybody else who's not sitting here at the table, right? Because there's lots of other voices that that need to be heard in in addition. To, to, to the voices here, right? Um, we good with that? All right. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you know, and we also, again, as we, as we dig into the weeds in terms of uh, a training, right, we, we certainly will highlight and outline, um, you know, all of the different duties and responsibilities, right, and we'll, we'll um, or you guys together, will start to figure out what that looks like, right, and how you're going to, to implement those or how what the tangible and deliverables look like with respect to that as well. Um, but I also want to point out that, that you will absolutely have the support, um, not just of the monitoring team, not just of the Department of Public Safety, um, but also the law department as well. And so, you know, I think we, uh, you know, myself as well as Director Griffin has, has you know, hopefully made that abundantly clear um, to you guys that, that we are here to support you. Um, you know, by, by charter, the law department um, is required to provide representation to, to all boards and commissions with uh, the same way we do with all departments across the city. Um, and so, so that won't be, uh, that, that won't be any different here, here with the commission as well, right? But understand that, right, there is a, there certainly is a level of, of uh, discretion as well. And so what I mean by that is, should there ever be a conflict, right, with the representation received um, by the law department, this commission has the ability via ch uh, Charter Amendment 115 to, to seek outside counsel um, to be able to address those conflicts, right? And so, so I want to make sure that that's clear um, with respect to the independence of this commission as well, right? So, so you will have re uh, representation from the law department, um, but, but again, there are a number of different ways that, that you'll be supported uh, in these roles. Um, and, I, and I know I didn't... Um, Put them on the agenda, but but I don't know if Mark, if you want to share <laughs> any other <laughs> words. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you to all of you. In, in terms of the law department, uh, we will do everything uh, to support you. But again, as uh, Chief Thomas said, you're also independent, so you have the ability to, to hire outside counsel as well. Uh, but as we kind of navigate many of the different issues in terms of complying with consent decree, dealing with collective bargaining issues, that sort of thing, uh, we are here to. Uh, I also want to kind of talk about outreach, which is uh, some of you I've spoken with directly, but you should always feel free to uh, contact anyone in the law department uh, directly. Uh, if you have a question, we can answer it. Uh, if we can't answer it, then we'll try to get back to you with, with an answer. So thank you, Chief Thomas. Um, so, so again, as we talk about Section 115, another piece that's included um, is, is the, the office and staff. Um, for for the CBC, which is which is headed up by an executive director. So um, so so Jason Goodrick mentioned earlier um, uh, some of some of the structure, and, and so um, I want to just expound on that a little bit more, um, and because this again will also be an ongoing conversation, right? And so um, so again, it is the responsibility of the commission to to nominate an executive director to be appointed by the mayor to essentially uh, 
oversee the office and operations of, of the commission staff. And so, um, and so one of the good things about, um, one of the good things, that, or one of the many good things, but another good thing I should say, uh, with respect to the charter amendment is that it already outlines the duties and responsibilities of the executive director, right? And so, um, as I've mentioned to, uh, um, have I mentioned to, to some of you, if not all of you, um, you know, so what will be required going forward is essentially uh, we will work and, and again, we will get support from our Department of Human Resources um, in, in City Hall and in setting all of this up. But essentially, we will need to create, uh, create that position, right, um, in accordance with Section 115. And then that position will need to be posted. Um, and, and advertise for, right? So, and then there would need to be a process, a hiring process for, for what that looks like, right? And so we certainly already have a model set in place that the city administration uses with, with all of its hires. And so, so we certainly don't need to reinvent the wheel here when it comes to that. Um, but, but that will be a very uh, a close order of business, right, for, for the commission so that, so that the staff in place can, can move forward. Um, but in the in the interim, right? There's also the ability to to appoint an interim um, executive director to the extent that it may take time, right? To 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 find to find the perfect candidate, um, you know, if, if that doesn't already exist internally, et cetera. And so, um, so so that's something I do want to put on your radars. Um, that that that's something that you may want to uh, seriously consider is is the interim because as Jason mentioned as the administrative manager he doesn't have the the duties and responsibilities um, or some of the same powers of is what the executive director would have and so um, in terms of management and being able to to make ensure that you guys have the support that you need especially um, as you begin and, and begin your operation um, you know that that's 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 going to be key and crucial and so again um, you know, the administration, we are here to support and, and making sure we, we set that up. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail when we um, get into some other business things a little bit later. Um, but that said, uh, let's see, any, any questions so far? Are y'all sure? No questions? Because on email, y'all got all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all been lighting my email up for, for months <laughs> with questions. Now y'all in person. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, Sharina. <laughs> so yeah, so again, that, that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we leave here again after kind of a lot of the introductions and, and, and overview. Um, that's part of the conversation that we want to have today so that there's a, a, a clear path forward, right, in terms of, um, you know, how you communicate. Um, you know, one of the things that we will include when we get into uh, placing more formal training materials, right, is, is making sure that there is an understanding um, with respect to public records. Um, with respect to open meetings, right? So we've started to have that conversation a little bit with, with uh, setting up for, for today's meeting. Um, and so um, actually to that end, um, I'll just point, right, to, so uh, with respect to Ohio's Open Meetings Act, right? And so again, very, very high level here. Um, but again, we will absolutely go into the weeds. Um, we sent you guys a ton of different resources. You guys should have the um, the full sunshine sunshine laws manual. Um, so hopefully you've had an opportunity to at least start to to look at that. Um, we've also sent you um, some uh, training um, uh, training webinars um, with respect to open meetings as well. So again, those happen on a monthly basis or every other month um, through the Ohio Attorney General's office. So that's something that um, I, many of us in the law department have participated in. Um, so that's also another good resource to make sure that you have an adequate understanding. But again, also, again, we in the law department will also make sure that we support you um, as well. We've already confirmed with our uh, chair of our public record section, um, the attorney that, that oversees that. Um, so she she's agreed to come in and you know to come to a session um, to explicitly talk through details and be able to answer more specific questions with respect to the sunshine laws. Okay, um, now when we talk about sunshine laws, um, generally that means two different things, um, or it includes two things. That is the Open Meetings Act and the Public Records Act. Okay, uh, with respect to open meetings, so. <clears throat> 
I think first it's important to make sure that you understand what is considered a meeting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, it's three parts to that, right? So three parts to what, what creates a meeting. One, um, any prearranged gathering, right? Now you run into each other on the street, okay, maybe no meeting, maybe, right? <laughs> But if there was any discussion, any discussion that happened beforehand about, oh, let's, let's set up, let's, let's go to lunch, right? Doesn't matter, right? Any prearranged um, is, is one element to that, okay? Um, the second element is if there is a majority of you, right? There are 13 commissioners, so seven of you. If seven of you are present, okay? Seven of you are present, it's a meeting, right? Um, so again, if it's prearranged, seven of you are there, and the last piece is if there is any discussion of public business, okay? Any discussion of public business. Now, I wanna be very explicit or, or clear about uh, what that means and what that does not mean. So, it does not mean that you're making, that you're only making any official decision, right? So you don't get to come together and say, well, we're not gonna take the final vote on this, so this isn't a public meeting, right? But we're going to discuss it. So even if, so, so even if you don't necessarily make that final call, right, or you, or you do a roll call vote, right, having the discussion about something that's related to CPC business, okay, is, is going to lean towards being a public meeting. All right, does that make sense? All right, so if it's prearranged, seven of you show up, and you talk about CPC business, it's a public meeting, right? We clear on that. Mm -hmm. So, so you're not gonna go try to meet up for lunch and think, okay, this, this, okay, all right, good. All right, yeah. Question. All three have to be present, right? Yes. Okay. So yes. So three of us can meet up for lunch, talk about whatever. That's not a meeting. Potentially, and because and, okay. and so and the reason why the reason why I say potentially is because this also applies to subcommittees. Right, so there will, so and again, um, when, when Jason comes back up in a second, um, we'll talk, he'll talk a little bit more about kind of breakdown of, of operations and things like that, uh, we'll, which may include you guys dividing up into committees to, to handle different things, right? As you all have seen with trying to come together for this meeting, right, 13 of you coming together to handle each and every single uh, piece of commission business is, is impractical. Right, so so it may be it may behoove you to, to break out into committees um, for specific areas, right? And so so again, Jason will outline for uh, that for you uh, momentarily. And so so if there is a quorum or majority of that committee, right, of that subcommittee, mm -hmm. it's a meeting. Okay. okay. So so that's why I say so. It might be three of you, but if that's three of you on the committee, meeting. Okay. Yeah. So, good question. So, <clears throat> during the pandemic, oh, so the, que the question was, is there, um, is there flexibility for having virtual meetings? Um, so, very, very good question. So, um, one of the things that happened in the pandemic is um, the, the state issued legislation that potentially put an exception in the Open Meetings Act. So, prior to the pandemic, um, meetings had to happen in person, right? Your vote didn't count unless you were in person. Um, that was, um, I guess, Paul, so to speak, right? And virtual meetings were allowed up and through a certain time. Um, and so that has stopped at the state level. <laughs> However, one of the things that the, one of the things that the Open Meeting Act does is it gives deference to municipalities that are chartered. Right, so if there is a charter provision with respect to open meetings, then then that can control whenever whenever there's potential conflict. And so, so as I also sent you guys via email, is our local ordinance um, under the city's charter that um, that allows for virtual meetings. Okay. Um, so so there there are some some ways to be able to to make that happen. But again, the the de it's all in the details, right? Um, and so so we can certainly talk more. Um, and again, can provide support as to um, whatever it is you might be planning to make sure that you are compliant uh, with the Open Meetings Act. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So, um, so again, so that's that's the definition of a meeting. Um, 
once it's clear that you are having a meeting, there are some requirements imposed on you as a public body um, by the Ohio Me or uh, by the Ohio Open Meetings Act. So, of those duties, first is notice. Okay, so there needs to be a notice that is issued uh, prior to the meeting. That notice needs to be issued to the public, uh, to media who request it, to other interested parties. Right, it needs to be widespread that you're having a meeting. Right. So, so, and, and it needs to be, and it needs to be conspicuous, right? So, so not a little flyer that you toss out the window and say, okay, you know, we're having a meeting, right? That, that, that doesn't cut it. Um, and so, so by example, what we did in preparation of this meeting, um, so, you know, once we finally got a time, draft their press release or our communications department, um, you know, issued that press release to media outlets um, to, and also to, to those who asked, um, as well to, to make sure that that was um, that that got distributed right and so so the news put it out there you know I was I was sitting at home last night right watching spectrum spectrum news and it popped up on the on the screen like oh commission meeting happened tomorrow I'm like oh that's our that's our meeting right but they got that because we sent them a press release so that it could be widespread on the news right so notice is the first requirement um, there's a regular notice for, for, for a regular meeting, and then there's notice for a special meeting, right? So, because there can be special meetings. So when you have, when you guys are having your regular meetings, um, and, and as you pinpoint the scheduling for that, um, the notice for that requires that you, that you include the time and place of the meeting, right? That's, that's essentially that, right? And how the public can access it. So if you're going to meet in other spaces, as, as some of you may know, the prior commission met um, in other places or in in the community, whether it was the rec centers, um, you know, try see other places, um, you know, so so wherever you decide to to hold your meetings, um, the time and place needs to be there. If you are calling a special meeting, right? So if some some emergency situation comes up and you need to call a special meeting, not only do you need to include the time and place, but then you also need to include the reason. Right, the public needs and has a right to know why are you calling a special emergency meeting? Okay, um, so so the notice is the first requirement. The second piece is that the meeting, yeah, um, Chandra. Feel free to address this later. But one thing I was wondering was for um, for meeting. So I know that it has to be broadly distributed. Are there certain places it needs to go, like on the city's website? Or, and then there are there are certain people that we need, and I know the staff of the of the CPC will help with this, but you know, are, are there certain because you know they're trying to do at least 24 hours um, notice plus then how you know if there's a specific city person that needs to put it in the website, oh. is there a deadline that they have for it needs to go to them by this specific time, or is it just generally it needs to be you need to show that in a good faith effort you put it in a number of different places. Um, so, so a little bit of both, right? Okay. So, so generally, yes, there needs to be a good faith effort that, that this was widely distributed. You're absolutely spot on that the staff, um, you know, staff will be supportive in, in making sure that gets distributed. Um, you know, it's always good practice to make sure that uh, meeting note or meeting notices are posted online on on the CPC's website. Make sure that that's on any you know community calendars, right? Those types of things. And again, you know, we we, we have comms teams that that you know we, we we do this all the time, right? So whether it's out of the um, whether it's out of City Hall, whether it's out of the the CPC staff, um, we we have the resources and tools to make sure that that happens. Um, some specific requirements that do come into place, for example, so if there are news outlets um, that explicitly ask, all right, then there is an obligation to make sure that you tell them specifically. Okay, yes. So, so does that same requirement work work for community organizations? That oh wait, is your mic on? I was just asking, does that same requirement work for community organizations that have requested notification? I am concerned if the only access is, is uh, uh, as far as a notice, is electronic. Mm -hmm. I represent a lot of communities that where there is a, uh, a digital divide, yeah. and I want to make sure they know because a lot of the allegations about police misconduct have come from these communities. And so I, I, you know, I think that there should be some other access other than electronic. 
Yep. And especially if we have a regular meeting, once we have to determine what a regular meeting date and time and place would be, um, you know, to send it to uh, maybe some of the community centers, send it to some of our larger churches, send it to libraries, a printed, posted something, which has often has happened with some of the division meetings of police departments, sure. because we have gotten them at our community center before. But I don't want us to overlook those demographics that might not have access digitally. You Absolutely. know, Absolutely. I want to make sure that we provide print copies at some point to major organizations or institutions in the city of Cleveland, and especially those communities that might be limited as far as technology. And we aren't just talking about a computer. We aren't just talking about a telephone. Uh, we're also talking about whether they can afford to have internet in their homes. We're talking about whether they have the ability to access it online. You know, there is a real digital divide in Cleveland. And I just want to make sure that the people who, whose communities are most impacted by what is allegedly police misconduct, that they have an opportunity to engage in these meetings with us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, well taken. You know, and, and, and again, you know, some of the provisions or the legal standards, right? This, this is the floor, it's not the ceiling, right? So okay. it's certainly, you know, there, there's absolutely opportunity, and I, I encourage that, right? You absolutely should make sure that we're covering bases to make sure that this is inclusive as possible. Wholeheartedly agree. Okay. Um, so, so again, there's this notice requirement, then there's the requirement that the meeting is open, um, right? So, so if you're going to do a live stream as we're doing today, um, if there's going to be, you know, a, allowing the public to be able to, to physically be present, um, you know, so those are all things as well. But essentially the, the, the thought here is no secret meetings, right? That's, that's essentially what that comes down to is, is, is no secret meetings. Um, and then lastly, uh, minutes. Okay, so, so when you're having a public meeting, there needs to be a record of, of what was talked about. Now, granted, um, so, so you'll likely appoint a secretary as well, right, in addition to, um, you know, in addition to a board chair in terms of oversee or oversight um, or pres uh, presiding over meetings. And, and those minutes uh, don't necessarily need to be a transcription of, of, of word for word, but it needs to be if, if I'm somebody from the public and I wasn't at the meeting, I should be able to figure out what happened at the meeting by these, by these minutes, okay? So again, doesn't it need to be word for word, but I should be able to figure out like, okay, they came to this decision because, because of X, Y, and Z. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, so, so, so that's just kind of requirement there. Um, and again, we will go into a lot more detail, but I wanted to at least you know, provide, that, um, provide that quick overview. Um, and then lastly, before I turn it over to Jason um, for, for our next segment, is um, briefly mention the Public Records Act, right? So we talk about meetings, and then the other piece of the Sunshine Laws are public records. And so, so to be clear on, again, that's, that's kind of three, three parts as well to, to determine whether or not something is a public record. Um, and so it's defined as any document uh, device item, and this is regardless of its physical form, um, so it can be electronic as well, um, is, is kind of that, that first piece, right? So any document device item, electronic or physical. Two, if that, if that item or that thing was created or received by the public office. So it's not just the emails that you send out, it's also the emails that you send or that you receive. Right? It's not just the documents that you send out, it's the physical documents that, that you also receive as well. So all of that can be potentially, uh, potentially a public record. Um, and then lastly, if that document serves the organizations, um, and it includes functions, policies, decisions, procedures, operations, or any other activity of the commission. Right? So if that document includes any, inf any of that type of information, right? it's likely that that's gonna be considered to be a public record, all right? Um, so again, and with respect to public records, we have an obligation to make sure that we respond um, in a reasonable amount of time is if we receive public records requests. Um, we, um, you know, as, public, as a public entity, as public bodies, um, you know, are, are subject to significant fines and, and other sanctions if we don't comply 
with with public records requests as well. So, um, you know, so again, that's that's another area that you'll want to be mindful about. Um, but again, we will absolutely talk more in detail about that. But you know, as you continue communication with each other, just something I want you to be mindful about, um, mindful about going forward. Okay. Um, so again, lots of intricacies there um, that that we will that we will certainly get into. Um, all right. Any any questions? Okay, great. So that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason for the next segment. Um, we'll start talking operations. Okay. Uh, the rest of the staff come on up also. I'm going to do a, some introductions during this point here too as well. So the staff you're going to meet this evening has uh, been part of this uh, since 2018. Um, I've been here since 2017. I'm going to let them take a moment to introduce themselves. And one of our uh, staff is uh, outside. I think he's uh, door tending at the moment. So when he comes back up, uh, we'll, we'll let him introduce uh, himself as well. OK. Hello. Um, my name is Sarah Anderson. Uh, I'm the communication specialist with the commission. And I'm also a Cleveland resident of 10 years in the West Park neighborhood. Close. Sorry. <laughs> um, my role here is to provide uh, project support to each commissioner and as a group. Uh, so, and that takes the form of event coordination, uh, visual communications, and um, technology support when needed. Uh, so, for example, uh, when you know work groups or um, committees are formed to uh, talk about um, to develop recommendations on certain topics or policies, um, I help. You know, I'm involved from the beginning to the end. So from promotion, you know, making sure it's, uh, you know, the community is aware of it, uh, know all the details, making sure print flyers are made, you know, making sure it's available everywhere. Uh, I host the meetings on WebEx and Zoom if it's virtual, and I'll live stream that, things like that. And finally, um, you know, I help format the final report for distribution and all the ways to share it. So. Um, in print, social media, uh, the, uh, the email list, and to the website. So um, with that, it's great to meet you all. Glad we're all here. And I look forward to uh, working with you. And good evening to you all. My name is Shalina Williams. I'm affectionately known as Shelly, so please feel free to call me Shelly. Uh, Sarah and I, we are kind of partners. We do a lot of the same things he does digitally, I do it out in the community. So I'm partnered with a lot of community organizations um, across, across town. I attend lots of community meetings, again, across town, east, west side. Um, it is a pleasure to meet you all. I'm sure that I will be speaking with each one of you individually and working collaboratively together. Um, welcome. And we also have currently um, a research and policy analyst. That's Ryan. He's uh, when he comes back up, I'll let him uh, say hello as well. Um, and I am, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my past service. My my title was the executive director uh, since 2017. I was um, brought on by uh, Dr. Rhonda when she was uh, still with us, as well as uh, some of the other commissioners. Um, and at that time, um, it was a different commission. So they were, uh, had been through a lot in two years. So they went two years without staff. So that meant that all the things that we're talking about, right, the, the marketing themselves, the, the, the research they had to do, all of those things they were doing on their own. They were very working board. Um, and that caused a lot of unnecessary stress. So when the staff got here, um, integration into getting us effective, as Aisha mentioned, there is a great history. It's in your um, folders. We uh, took out all the monitoring team reports, going back to the very first one, that tell the story of the commission so that you're able to read that. Uh, you also have those annual reports, which are an effort of uh, the design work and, and the way it looks. That's, that's we mentioned uh, Sarah. That's what she does. So we have the capability to do these things in-house already. We are short one staff person who's separated uh, to go back to work for council a long time uh, uh, employee of the city of Cleveland and she started out in council and wanted to go back. Uh, she took a, 
a job in Joe Jones office. So we do have what would be an office manager and a business manager position here um, that handles finance, um, that kind of stuff. Um, HR logistics manages the office. Um, so all of those things wrapped into another position which is, is currently vacant. Um, my job isn't that different from what 115 says it is. Um, that's actually the work that I've been doing. The only difference is the charter empowers an executive director to be able to really do the stuff. So before we run a mother may I system with the commission in operations, right, I'd have to call over the city and say, you know, may I please have this? Can we do this? And a lot of times that was a point of conflict and contention. So 115 will be able to solve that by empowering whatever executive director decision you make um, to be able to do a lot more stuff in-house, right? Um, so uh, logistically, there's still a lot to be worked out on how those old things will occur. Um, but as Delante pointed out, um, it's probably within your benefit to sooner rather than later make decisions about the staff. Um, the, the other staff positions here, they are civil servants. I'm a civil servant as well. Um, they have turnkey positions, so that is not really an issue. You're going to need a marketing person. You're going to need community engagement, right? You're going to need a business operations position, all of that. It's the executive director is more of a political appointment now, similar to other political appointments in the city, uh, like Director Howard is. Um, so it, it's uh, a little more empowering as well. And it has all those duties in 115 to be able to enter into contracts, to be able to hire people in this office so we could fill vacancies quicker, all of those things, uh, the sooner we do that. So really, uh, the model of this office has always been like, our job is to turn your vision into a reality, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and we'll talk more about it as we get into the rules and, and lines of separation. So those of you who served on boards before probably already understand the difference between what the board's work is and then what operations work is, right? But we haven't always been that successful in dividing the two. And some people who have been on boards or have been executive directors before, um, they default to their comfort zone you know, and they want to get into the operational side. And I see a little bit of this here already. It's a tendency to, well, how do we notice all those things? We're very equipped to do most of the turnkey operations for you. So you just tell us what you want and we get it done for you. It takes the load off. It lets you guys focus on the work of your committees, the work that's outlined for you in 115. And that's really, really been a success story, the way we've done that. And for the volunteer commissioners who were in the past, and you'll hear from some of them before, um, having a staff is just awesome. You know, because they could pick up the phone and say, can you do this? And it's like, yes, and then they could go back to their day jobs. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of what we want to do. So, And it works for individuals, too. So um, individual commissioners should build a relationship with the staff, particularly the executive director, right? You bounce ideas off before you take them to committees or groups. You know, uh, we're in this work all the time. So, you know, 2,000 hours a year or more, we're in here, and it's fast moving. Police are always doing new things. New policies are out. There's no way... There is no way that each of you can keep up with all of that, right? So to check in with staff and say, hey, what's going on in this particular issue before you want to tackle something or bring an idea forward and flesh that out before you bring it to the public and the committee, that is standard operating procedure. It's, it's worked really well for us, and, and that's how things are mostly done here. Um, <clears throat> continuity is important, and or, or organizational learning is important. Um, so that's one of the things um, that... We looked at 100 years of policing. You might have heard the mayor say that in his uh, uh, online commercial for the new commission. It was great, right? He said, for 100 years, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't had good police reform, and now is the day, right? Now we're starting with 115. Uh, and that came from work that we have done here, uh, looking at all the boards and bodies, all the reform efforts in the Cleveland Division of Police. That is also in your binder. It was a great project, started a lot of conversations. Um, and how that plays into it is it's a learn annuity from 2015. Uh, so you can already know what commission has done, what past mistakes have been made, what learning there is there. Um, it's very important since you don't have that on the board that you do have that somewhere. Uh, because what we found in the 100 Years Project is the police do have organizational learning, even though uh, the consent decree and the monitor have criticized them and said, you guys don't learn great. Well, that's not necessarily true. Their organizational learning is called tradition. And one thing that's ingrained in their tradition is the ability to really resist reform, right? And it's not always intentional. It's not always overt. But they are slow to change, right? And they benefit every time the civilian side starts over, right? Mm. So if you guys come in and you say, well, we're going to start from scratch, the police benefit from that because they're not starting from scratch. They're starting from tradition. And it goes long back. 
And some of those things are what we're trying to address here in your 2027 goals. Um, so it's important for us to be aware of continuity as well, what other things are working, what best practices, and the staff is certainly a great source to help you with that. Um, because let's look at OPS, it's a great example. Um, and this is true of civilian oversight in other places. And I'll just touch on that a little bit, so the concept of civilian oversight. I know Delante um, sets you out some great information from NACOL. NACOL is a national board. We are a member of NACOL. Um, one of you eventually will become the voting member for NACOL for this organization. Um, you'll have to determine how that works in the, in the future. Um, but civilian oversight isn't new, okay? In some places, it's 40 year, years old or more. And in some places, it's just as broken as the police department is when you look at it as an organization from that standpoint, right? So we want to learn from that as well. We want to make sure that as we start this journey here, you know, we do, we, we look at those best practices, the independency, the independence, empowered, the diversity, um, transparent, even-handed, permanent, broad in scope, funded. All these things are essential to, to success, right? But it's also about each of you and the way you treat this. You know, what's our shared, shared vision? What's our values? What do we want to learn from other organizations that have been around for a long time? Because you can look at Chicago. They're in their third iteration of civilian police reform right now. Each people that came before them failed. What they needed to be reformed as well. So we got to learn these lessons and we got to pay close attention to what's been done, what's worked, what hasn't, and how do we approach this differently, right? And I'll go into it a little more. One of the ways that we've always approached it is, first, it's about the community, right? The more in touch you are with the community, the better off you'll be. A lot of times, the reasons those organizations failed is because they decided they were becoming the expert and no longer needed the community to guide them, right? So that's one of the things that, and we're very good at what Delante mentioned. We will make sure you're noticed. We'll make sure you get out there. We have long established relationships with a lot of groups. You know, we can find the right places for you to meet. So those decisions don't have to be on you guys. You know, you could give us general guidelines like, hey, we want to go east this time. We want to go west. And we'll get into that about meeting. Uh, but the community is really important. And oversight in Cleveland isn't even new. So Office of Professional Standards, you guys are an oversight body. OPS operations falls in your purview as well, right? Looking at it from a broad perspective. What happens when a civilian complaint comes forward? How well does it perform? But even OPS in 1982 when they were formed, it was very similar to the circumstances that you're in today. There were several high profile police uh, homicides in the city which resulted in citizen, a group similar to Citizens for Safer Cleveland going out there and demanding reform. They took it to the ballot and the Office of Professional Standards was formed. The CPRB was formed. So why are we now needing to create another body, right? Because we, we didn't have continuity, we didn't, and it was lost along the way, and something happened over there where it became bureaucratic enough that now in the consent decree, that is part of the reform effort, right? So the first civilian oversight endeavors here in Cleveland even didn't get off to the greatest start, right? So there's lessons to be learned in all of that. That's kind of my cautionary tale. It's not unusual that you're going to go through a little bit of storming period. You know, if you've ever been part of some team building or leadership class, you probably heard storm, uh, form, storm, norm, and then perform, right? So there will be a little bit of discourse amongst you about what should we do first, how should we do it, right? And that's okay. Uh, you know, from experience, the trick to that is just, just keep it healthy, right, not toxic. And that goes with your relationships with the city and the division as well. The past commission has had some moments that were very toxic. Uh, you know, Delante mentioned setting up a, uh, uh, how do we request information and get those things. Well, there's actually a court order already in place for requirements for some of those processes, how long it's supposed to take you to get documents. And that came out of a very toxic um, relationship at that time between the law department, the division, and the commission. So we have a chance to reset that. We have a new administration that has, is doing everything they can to help and assist, from my perspective so far, to get you going. Um, and we have new players and, and a new commission. So hopefully that won't follow us forward and we'll be able to start right where we left with things moving, flowing, good work being produced, et cetera. Oh, and this is very, feel free to stop me anytime with a question, right? <laughs> Yeah, and we'll go into that in the budget, but yes, we are being paid, right? Um, but there are certainly issues with the way we were initially set up. 
that need to be discussed and budget needs to be a top priority. So I'm going to move into budget and we'll, we'll go through that and I'll allow you to ask questions, okay? Um, <clears throat> So you have this big book in front of you. It has a table of contents. Obviously, there's a lot to learn in this book. Um, what it represents is probably uh, some of the most important works we've done or, or policies that we've touched on over the years, uh, as well as some other items in there. Um, right now, there's a section in there that has an operations and procedure manual. And I have my table of contents here. Um, and that is in section four. Uh, no, let me see here. Uh, it's section two, right after the charter section 115, the copy of 115 that you have as a reference. Um, there is a draft CPC operations and procedures manual. What you may hear this called in, in other terms is basically bylaws, right? This would be a guiding doctrine for you all to follow as a group. Um, this is a draft, so when people say, well, what is the staff been doing uh, while we're in transition? The answer is we have a really good set of uh, uh, operating manual procedures ready for you to consider. We have we've been working on training doctrines. We've been getting out preparing the community uh, for your arrival. Um, so a lot has been done in the transition from when the last commission met to the point where we're meeting right now. And this is one of those things. Uh, so again, this is a draft. Um, and one of the things that's going to be suggested um, that you do tonight in your business section, uh, and this is a recommendation from me, is that um, you establish a rules committee, um, and the rules committee will be specifically to look at adopting all of your guiding procedures going forward, and then when you have an amendment, the place that it would go first is a rules committee, and then forward to the group. It's a standard practice uh, um, to do something like that, so that's one of the committees that I think would be most beneficial for you guys to jump into. But you don't have to reinvent the wheel because we're giving you good drafts of rules to consider already. So that would just mean talking out amongst yourselves, getting some feedback. The other option is we're going to go through this. And you can always adopt the rules interim and have a committee as well, right? So you have a quorum here tonight. If you felt like rules would help you get a good start and you like what's in here when we go through it, you could say, hey, one of you might decide, let's make a motion to adopt these interim and then establish a committee to revise them as necessary, right? But at least we'll give you a guiding doctrine to go from. None of this is um, novel in here. It was taken from either CPRB's rules and manuals, OPS's rules and manuals, uh, Office of Professional Standards, the Civilian Police Review Board, and the past bylaws of the commission. Um, so those are the sources of what's in here. Uh, so as everybody find it in here, it's in section two. I want to just clarify. So as far because we probably will need to walk out there with some rules. Um, you know, they're not like a package, right? If we like want this one, but we don't want this one, and we do discussion on this one, we can just we, right, we can just select uh, the yeah. rules that we feel comfortable um, pushing through today because I'm sure and it's And it's your and it's your rules. It's your ideas. So you'll get a chance when we get to the business part. You guys can deliberate this. And you know it's a it's a committee. So that's part of being a committee. You can decide what's best for you. Um, but I don't think there's that much controversial stuff in here. And a rules committee can always sort out any issues um, that need attention. So like if we say, well, hey, let's let's look at this because there are things you need to consider in here like leadership and how that works that that are undefined in these rules until you define it. Um, so let's just start with, um, in the beginning, section one, is everybody uh, find this? Does everyone have this section that we're looking at here? Section two uh, in your manual. Um, it's the, it has a cover that looks like this. Uh, it says operations and procedures manual. Some of it is redundant with 115. That's, that's typical of, of operations manuals, right? So it, it kind of re clarifies and reemphasizes the law that binds you. Um, and so that's what we see in the beginning here. The purpose is just reiterating sec Charter Section 115. It's pretty much cut and paste from 115. Um, we talked about authority and what the difference is. So the previous commission had to use influence. That's all they had, really. You know, they had to go out and do their best work. And then they had to try and get convince people why that work should be taken as a recommendation. The biggest difference with you guys is, is 
Not so much the work you'll be doing, because most of this is stuff that's already been done by the previous commission. It's the power you have um, to take it to a higher level, right? And there's four specific things in there that you have final authority on, and that's a pretty strong word. And I expect that it'll be contested at some point, uh, if you actually have that or not. I'm sure you're all aware of that and have heard uh, that you know some of this may be contested, and that's the right of people. That's why we have courts, right? But it shouldn't uh, persuade you from from doing your best in the faith of what the community asks you to do and have final authority. So the threat of a lawsuit alone should not be reason to not consider what your power is and use that power if you feel fit, right? Uh, so there are a few things in there that you can review on time. I'm not going to cover 115 because it's, it's completely in there. So that takes us to um, what the operating manual is. Um, and that's on page five. It kind of explains the scope and weight of the manual, right? So in the hierarchy of city, if you haven't been in government before, right, we have the broader law. We have the city charter, right? Uh, we have to know those things. This manual can't be in conflict with law or charter, obviously, right? 115 prevails according to what 115 says. But again, it could be tested. Um, and just to give you an example, OPS in 1982, when it passed, um, the police unions did sue. Um, and OPS didn't become official until 1988. It went all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court to be argued, right? So um, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. But at the end of the day, you should still, as I said, plan for to come to work, get the things done in 115 you need to do, regardless of those situations, right? Um, so this kind of, the scope of five just talks about conflicts of law and how a manual works for those who haven't done something like this before. And then uh, duties, responsibilities of the commission, its members, and staff. So the manual rules covers your ethical responsibilities. These ethical responsibilities are uh, pretty much the same national ethical code of ethics that NACOL uses for all civilian oversight organizations. You'll see similar code of ethics uh, in many city departments um, that, that uh, 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 take the time to bound themselves around ethics. Very important uh, piece of it. But I think for all of you, you've, you've, you, you know, you're all at that level. You all understand ethical obligations, so I don't have to go through these point by point. Um, you know, as I said before, conflict is inevitable. Keep it healthy, not toxic. And one point I'll just say that's, that's very important that I have hanging on my wall, right? And that's, as individuals, we must be better than the systems we work within, right? And in this instance, we even have to be better than the, the areas we're asked to participate in reform with. And I think some of the hardest lessons learned here are when people slipped and then, you know, an issue that happened with a commissioner personally became the talking point. And it was an issue that the police department would use or the city would use to distract from the work of the rest of the commission. So one person's decision can distract from the good work of the entire body um, if, they, if they were to stray from this, right? So self-policing is very important in that regard, um, just to you know, make sure that you're setting the highest standards in all facets of your life. Because those of you who haven't been in public life before, um, it can be a bit of a shock, right? Because um, your privacy isn't necessarily always your privacy anymore. And you'll learn as you go, uh, but it can be intrusive. You know, your personal life could become a topic. Uh, you know, it's not unusual if you, if you make a decision that makes people um, hostile towards you that they will attack you personally and the things you do. The media may it, go deeper into your life. That's just part of public life. It's part of public service. So do your best to stay healthy and well in that regard and, uh, you know, and find people with experience or mentor to, to help you through that if you can or if you have an issue that you want to talk about, hey, you know, how do I address this? If you feel like it could be a conflict, you know, you always have the confidentiality of staff. We've been through a lot of things before, so just keep those in mind as well, okay? All right. So professional work expectations are pretty much the same that we've seen. It is important to be effective as a committee and a board, right? Um, preparation is a big thing. You know, if you, look at, if you look at the difference of boards that are super effective, you know, when they're calling a question, and they know that because it's on the agenda of advance, people do their research ahead of time. They come in ready with their vote. You know, the boards that tend to not do that end up stuck in a lot of deliberation and wasted time at the meeting itself. 
you know, uh, we've worked really hard to get past that where, you know, the pre-communications. So when Delante says things have to be public, right, it doesn't mean you can't study and research things before you come to a meeting, right? It doesn't mean you can't have already caucused in small groups about things that are not, you know, so council does that all the time. And when they come before to do their voting, you don't hear a lot of discussion or the discussion is very prepared. You know, people already know what they want to say um, at that moment in time. So that's kind of what professional worth ethics lay out. Um, it'll help you get there faster um, if you follow some of those guidelines. Um, on page nine, it's uh, composition of the board. It's pretty much exactly what uh, 115 says. Uh, so it's just worth repeating as a quick reference so that if you're in a meeting and you want to look at the manual rules, uh, you could come to that conclusion very fast. Um, on page 10, terms of membership, same thing. It's part of 115, vacancies of the board. That is also uh, the language from 115 that explains the process. And then we get to 11, leadership, right? Uh, this is one area that needs discussion eventually. Uh, right now, 115 says you have to have a chair. In the manual of rules, um, it says the term of chair is to be set by the board and the rules amended once a term and election cycle is agreed upon. So, you know, you can, the question of a chair right now, do you or do you not need one? 115 says you, ex you need a chair eventually. It doesn't put a timeline on it, okay? From experience, I could say jumping into a chair probably isn't the best decision until you get to know each other a little bit better, right? And you can always do other boards. It's a past practice. Each meeting you have, you you know, if you're interested in being a chair, take a turn at it. You know, be a chair pro tem. Just run a meeting for a session and see if you like it, if you don't like it, if you get a feel for it, right? I'm not saying it doesn't have to be a priority, but you don't have to jump into electing a chair right off the rip unless you feel it's appropriate for you to do for some reason. There are responsibilities of the chair that have been, um, that some are in 115 and some are past practice and most common for chairs to have. Um, so chair preside over all meetings of the commission and shall have the right to vote on questions. The chair shall ensure that all municipal and state laws adopted rules pertaining to activities and rules of the commission are faithfully executed. The chair shall act as the spokesperson in all matters pertaining to the commission. The chair shall sign documents on behalf of the commission and approval by the board. The chair pro shall perform such other duties and responsibilities opposed upon them by the commission, right? One thing I will say about uh, media appearances um, we've had a couple of trip ups with media appearances in the past. One of those trip ups landed us all the way in front of Judge Solomon Oliver. Your voices are going to carry a lot of weight moving forward, right? So it's important that if you want to speak, that you are speaking from an informed factual position. So how do you get there? Talk to staff first. If you're speaking about an issue, come and get a brief from us. We'll get you up to speed on what the latest facts are, what data we can get for you, right? The other point of that is you, you have to divide a line. If you're the chair or you've been asked to speak for the commission, then you can say, like, you know, the commission is going to do this, the commission is going to do that. If not, then it's very important that you say, this is my opinion, right? Because it, it, it really will um, cause interpersonal conflict in the board, and it will cause external conflict with the board if, if you're not very careful when you separate speaking your opinion and your experiences, which is fine to do, right? Um, all of you should get comfortable in front of the media and the cameras and speaking your opinions and things. You just have to be clear that this I'm speaking based on my experience and my beliefs, not the beliefs of the commission if you were to choose to do that. Okay, that's, that's just one note there that I have. Um, the other thing about leadership is um, a co-chair is just, again, the floor. Um, it, it's common practice that boards create other officers, other positions. This commission since 2015 has gone on the co-chair model. So you could write yourself a co-chair in here, split some of those uh, uh, leadership things up. It's worked really well. You're going to hear from past co-chairs this evening, tell you about their experience. One of the reasons it's worked really well is just amount of work. Um, so having a co-chair and say, hey, can you do this media thing? I can't do it. Yes. Okay, great. You know, can you, can you do this? Yes. Okay, great. It just has helped a little bit. So you're not, you do have to have a chair, uh, but it doesn't say you can't have, you know, any other combination of leadership that you guys think is the best model for you beyond that, right? So that's just the floor again. Um, moving to subcommittees, because Delante mentioned committees, right? Boards operate by committee. Every single project you have to do, uh, you don't all need to be doing every single project, right? That includes digesting these rules. It includes talking about your training. So there are some uh, minimum 
committees in here that are recommended in your rules, and that is uh, based on what you have to do, the work ahead of you. Um, so the minimum recommended committees are police investigations, discipline and accountability committee, um, police training committee, police policy committee, an outreach committee, a grants and budget committee, and a rules committee. All right. And that's just scratching the surface. So there are so many more things you can do. And so uh, it's my recommendation again tonight that you set up at least a few committees. One of them, grants and budget, and we're going to talk why about that. So that is so important to do immediately uh, because we're on a timeline with that. Council will f finalize and appropriate either the end of February or early March, uh, which means we will have to appear before council, and we are the only entity that can advocate for himself outside of the mayor's package. So the normal process and the process that's been in the past has been we have had to submit our our budget to the finance director and the finance director can red pen it the mayor can red pen it and then they take it to council and we have to just say yeah okay that's how it's been for the first time you guys have the ability to um, ask directly um, and there is actually a non-interference clause in there um, so they can review it for lawfulness so we certainly should send it over there and say hey what do you think of this budget are there any problems uh, and I'll get deeper into that with the budget but I recommend that's one of the committees that you guys uh, discuss tonight and see if there's any interest in that and also a rules committee at the minimum and then a committee that's not on here which would probably be a temporary one that I would recommend and we'll get into this is an internal training committee because this is just scratching the surface of the training that's recommended and expected of you um, so you will need to have a group to discuss you know what should our training commitment be what training should we get next what are our training options you know um, so those are the three that I would say would probably benefit you the most right off the start. Because before you get to the work of reforming the police department, you got to get your house in order. you got to get it running effectively, right, so that you can then do all of the work that the citizens asked you to do. Um, so the recommendations here and the thing is a committee should have at least three people but not more than five. You don't want a, a super wieldy committee and you don't want uh, it, it to be just two people. It's not really a committee if it's only two people, okay? Um, and then less formal, we'll talk about work groups. Work groups are what have, they're the backbone of the commission's work, okay? Work groups are like if you have an idea, a commissioner has an idea, they want to look at a policy, do some research. Let's say they wanted to look at vehicle pursuits, right? The best place to start with that before you, you may feed into a larger committee, like maybe that's in the police policy committee, right? And you say, we're going to form a work group. That's where we amplify ourselves, because as Delante said, you know, it's not just about you all, it's about getting the voices of the community, and we are very good at that. We've been able to get some of the best experts and best community members to work problems, and we've taken the model of the last five years, Alana, you've been part of the, the CPOP committee, right? We bring people in who, are, who just know this stuff, right? And, and then ask questions and develop policies and recommendations that way. And that's one place where you can do work um, and amplify yourself by bringing in communi community members into a work group, by bringing in uh, subject matter experts into that work group. It is the, it's been the backbone. It's been really successful. Um, and I think it's probably taking that model of collaboration there. We bring officers into a lot of the work groups with experience in that area. Um, and, and, and we've been able to get people to volunteer their time and put, I would say, thousands and thousands of dollars of free time that would get paid that money in the in the real world just because they're so interested in this work so work groups are important and that's in here as well establishing the norm of work groups now may, may i ask a question as far as the uh subcommittees um can a commissioner serve on more than one when you look at our numbers and you know what we're saying is sort of required it may require more than one committee is, is that permissible? I, I would say yes. It's not unless you rule yourself in there. It's not. It's not in here at the moment. A maximum number of committees. It's just how many people could be on a committee, yeah. right? So uh, certainly, you know, and it's a time commitment thing too. You're going to find, you know, that each of you are going to have to make hard choices about where you can put your time because there's just not an infinite amount of time, and you all have very successful and busy lives outside of this, right? So division of labor is very important. And trust is very important with committees, right? You have to trust that those people working on that issue care about it, are going to do their best, and bring their best work forward to the committee as a whole um, for consideration when they, when they get done on that issue. So 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about staff that's on page 13, right? Um, as Delante said, um, an executive director is very important when you look at these duties. They can enter contracts. We can hire you additional help here. Uh, we could spend money for you without needing to go through the approval process, which is long and lengthy and has been a significant point of conflict for the city. Only the executive director of Point Number 115 and sworn in by the mayor can do that. So without that power, we still have to go through external systems and having someone else do that for us. Right now, we're under the structure of public safety. They're doing a lot of that work for us. It's not a good structure for several reasons. One is they report to Kerry Howard, and there may be a time where you have a disagreement with the Department of Public Safety about what you want to do. So having them have the ability to slow you down or, or, or have insight into what you want to do strategy-wise um, through um, having the power to have to sign and be approval process isn't the best structure, okay? We've had conflict in the past. Right now it isn't so much, but it's because you're not, we're not doing the work we were before. But it's been one of the most significant points of conflict is the commission wanting to do something. And then financially, the powers that be will say, well, we're not going to fund you for that. So that's why it's written in here now that an executive director has power to enter into contracts, can do a lot of the things that the city had to do before, is an appointing authority for the uh, office, which means that um, each, each person ha that's a civil servant has to have an appointing authority. That means the people in this office work exclusively for this commission through the executive director. And I want to make that clear. I serve the citizens of Cleveland, and I serve the commission. I don't work for the administration. I don't work for the law department. Okay, My job has always been exclusively to the people and to this commission. Right. Um, so, so that's the difference between um, Delante and I is I don't have a director above me who can um, overrule an idea that I have or that I'm doing for you guys something for the commission, right? Right now, um, I serve the community and I serve you. So um, that is where my interest lies, okay? Uh, that is what I've been doing for the past six years. And that's, um, and I am willing to um, do that interim for you um, in this initial period if you were to choose that option, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that we're, we're uh, um, in a permanent relationship if you do that, right? I've been through this as my third board. It has been extremely stressful at some points, right? And it's an interview for me just as much as it is, is an interview for you all, right? But you can't, I can tell you uh, from this, from, from if you were to select me as interim, I would be happy to take that position to get you started. I've been invested in this from the start. It was one of my goals to have permanent civilian oversight here. Uh, in Cleveland, and we've reached that point. Um, so, you know, uh, just just as Delante mentioned, um, I'm not going to abandon you if you ask me to do that. Right now, I, I said I'll play it by ear, and, and if you guys ask me, I will I will make a commitment to stay at least as long as an interim period. Okay. Um, and these are the if you were to do that, once the mayor swore me in, I would have these duties to here to serve you and carry out these things quickly and efficiently. Um, And that's outlined in 115, as well as if, if there were a conflict with an executive director that you choose, removal of the executive director is also in the law, so it can be done. Um, staffing levels, we, we have a minimum of uh, an executive director, one assistant, and additional minimum support staff of three. It doesn't mean we can't ask for more, and I think everyone's in agreement. That's not going to be enough to do all this work, right? But it will be our job to argue that to council, why we need more people, what those people will do, right? Uh, so as we, when we move to the budget here on the next couple of pages, um, we've already kind of uh, fleshed out some ideas for that uh, that you guys would have to look at in a budget committee, agree to, bring it to the whole, take a vote if that's what you wanted to do. Day-to-day um, -day operations, again, this has been a point of contention. We had to have a consultant come in in, uh, in 2018 um, because, again, when you come in and you have a working board, right, the board's used to doing everything, and, and they had a hard time giving up some of that working stuff, so there was a lot of tension in, in where the division of labor is now. Um, what that consultant recommended is, you know, having a firm line, just like other places 
have with their boards, right? The board has an exclusive relationship with who they select to lead the office, right? That's their supervisory capacity. So the board would supervise the executive director. It says in the rules the chair takes on that responsibility, but it's really a committee as a whole. But day to day, it's the chair's responsibility, you know, to bring things to the attention of the board as far as how that's going in the executive director as well. Um, but it's really important to trust. So when you do select an executive director, right, to trust them to be able to carry out and, and do what the law empowers them to do without micromanagement, because that has been a, a significant hurdle to this board moving forward in the past, was that getting down into the weeds, when, and it took away from the ability to do the work that the commission had to do in the consent decree. And they were dinged for that by the monitor for a while until we had a consultant in to figure it out, and the consultant's like, look, go with the best practice, right? Board focus on board work, you know, staff focus on staff work. Right? It doesn't mean we can't share ideas because we're past that now. And you're inheriting a great place, a great office. It's really incredible what we've, what we've been able to do, and I'm very proud of it, right? Because one thing I will say, if you have to rely heavily on rules, right? If a year from now we're heavily on the rules all the time to keep us moving, then we haven't been successful. Because the commission that we just had, uh, where, where the co-chairs will, will be speaking on their experience about it, right? They hardly ever had to look at bylaws or bring up bylaws, right? The only thing you had to use bylaws for were, okay, we got to follow the rules of how to make a motion. But they weren't leaning on the bylaws to get the work done because it became so organic between staff and that commission that we just flowed really, really well, right? And we were all on the same page and we were very trusting of each other to get what we needed to get done. Um, and people were able to follow their passions. Because going back to those work groups, right, each one of you is going to have a passion that you're going to want to tackle about this police reform, right? And we can't do it all. But hopefully each other will be supportive of that. And the staff will definitely be supportive of you getting your individual the most you can out of this as well as the group. Um, but that's kind of what the reporting structure part says. It just says, you know, uh, that there should be a line there. Uh, how, the how the executive director reports in that line and the, d and the division of labors between the board and the executive director. All right. So orientation and training. There is in your manual um, a recommended training um, block that was created uh, here in this office. Okay. So what I did with this was take all of our past experience and knowledge um, that I'm aware of what I think you should need. And this is in, there's a section uh, that is just training, uh, and that is number four, commissioner training. And it has two things in there. In section four, it has this recommended outline for training, right? And it's just recommendations. It's based on past experiences, the, the things you will need to touch on in training in the future to really be prepared for what 115 wants you to do. So. Uh, starting with the orientation, you know, there's things about being a public official. There's things about, there's more in detailed operations about community police commission in general. There's general legal concepts, right? You guys are going to have to do investigations. You're going to have to understand collective bargaining. You know, there's uh, uh, Garrity issues that are at stake here, Fourth Amendment, First Amendment. Civil torts, you guys are responsible for looking into civil torts and making sure investigations get done. Subpoenas. And one of the biggest powers you have is the ability to conduct a public hearing, right? So all those things are going to probably require some training uh, at some point uh, before you do those. And then the bulk of the training is going, learning what the police do. So Delante, I know, has taken this, um, and they have set a training outline that's also included in there from that uh, police academy training that they'd like to give you. Again, you're independent, right? Um, so you should really be making these decisions because it's in 115 that you will make decisions about what type of training you want. That's why I recommend quickly forming a training committee and coming up with looking at these documents, figuring out what time commitments you're able to have, and then recommending that going forward so we could quickly set that up for you. Uh, but it is essential, and it is part of the consent decree that you do receive training that is the appropriate in, in quality, quantity, scope, and covers what your duties are, right? So that goes back to uh, the compliance issue that was brought up, right? We're going to have them not only looking at compliance with the whole consent decree, but that, those elements that you're responsible for, and part of that is training, right? And a lot of this we can do in-house, so you don't have to overthink it, right? If you say, these are the topics we want to hit, 
you know, you, again, you just let the staff know. We'll work with the law department and the rest of the city to get those for you as quickly as possible. There may be some elements that we have to put out, but we probably shouldn't have to do that for much. may need and others maybe don't so like writing reports like I might need that training but let's say Terry may not so how, could we have something like that where some offer to some I, I think there's something to be said about that you know obviously if it's something you do for a living right so like uh, if you're a lawyer I know we don't have a lawyer here right now but do you have to sit through the legal training it probably is good if you can but I but I think if you can show equivalency and the public is, it's really about the public feeling like confident in you, right? If you could show the public why you feel that wasn't needed, um, then I think that's okay, you know. And, it, and I would say that's something too, the training board could set some equivalency standards. You could say, hey, look, if I bring in professional certificates and things that I've already done in my life, can I have these five hours of my life back? You guys can set a standard, you know, and say, this is when we say an equivalency can be met, right? So. And that's why I recommend having that, that, that training committee. It won't be a long-standing committee. It'll just get you through this beginning, right? And then you could set yearly standards, too. You know, what is a commissioner's obligation each year? You know, if you're on a four-year term, how, what's the minimum hours you guys feel comfortable with getting outside exposure, learning about civilian oversight, right? There are conferences and seminars you can go to, all of those things. All right. So moving on to budget. And the CPC budget is in section three of your book. And again, this is not a set budget. Um, I don't know. They have not set a date yet for budget hearings at council, correct? Okay, yeah. So we do have some time here, but it won't be much time um, to, get, to get this done, right? So if you were to form a budget committee to discuss this, um, what 115 says you get a minimum budget of a million dollars plus, um, you know, percentage increase based on things that happen in public safety. And then you also have another roughly 1.2 million to do grants administration, right? The grants administration alone is going to be a tremendous amount of work um, to, to uh, get that up and running. Um, it doesn't mean that after we establish the program parameters, it won't be more turnkey in the future. Um, but 115 last year was standing and they went a whole year with appropriated grants money that didn't get done because you guys didn't exist yet right so we want to make sure we put some priority on keeping the citizens wishes to get some grant money out there in the community so that's one of the reasons why a budget committee has to, is essential because it will also include grants and setting up rules for the grants and that kind of stuff how do we evaluate grants what is the uh, what we want to do with our grant programs each year right similar to the way other agencies and nonprofits that administer grants do um, so the biggest part of our budget um, is typically staff, right? Um, so um, what you see here, um, you can see each year um, moving across, there's an actual comparison from 2019 to the estimated budget. Um, last year we were at 304,180 for staff that exists now. Um, and there is an increase there. We don't have the specific details yet. Um, Delante is working on that of what finance did with that. As soon as I get those, we'll get them to you guys to consider in the budget committee. Um, and I'm not going to go into super specific details about staff. I will tell you that when we were set up, right, um, we have civil service works in, in a certain way. So you have a civil service title and a working title, right? My civil service title is administrative manager. Um, you have two project coordinators here, uh, three project coordinators here, and there's a vacant assistant administrator. Each one of those is banded, right? What they did with this commission when it started was band everybody at the lowest. So what I did is when we hired, we went, made them the maximum offer we could on that band. But this staff right now is not consistent or comparable with most uh, um, other city departments. So project coordinators at OPS, for example, even make more money. So Shelley's equivalent at OPS makes a lot more money. So those things will have to be discussed because I will tell you the staff has put in a lot of hard work here, right? And and it was a real risk for them to stick around, right? Because you guys don't know them. You don't know what they've been through. But I did promise that one of the things I will advocate for if they stay is to make them whole, right? To do our best to bring equity up 
in this in this department so that the people here who have put in service and time are getting at least compensated at the same amount of their peers and I think it shouldn't be as much of a problem because I think Justin Bibb had said just as much last year that they wanted to raise you know pay professionals what they're worth um, so I, I don't think it'll be a hard fight but it is something that needs to be addressed across the board is equity and equality here in this office um, we did lose one really good person and it was a money issue she loved the job she loved the place she had years of service at the city and council and she she separated from us um, because um, I couldn't take any action as the administrative manager to, to I had no power to administer raises right that is a process exclusively over there until we have an executive director what is your current contract and staff contract right now for them being employees so they're civil servants so the contract is civil service rules of the city and that covers myself as well right so so we are civil service we don't have a specific contract we were hired into civil service jobs um, and we have all the rules that apply to us in in the city civil service rules right as far as hiring and firing and, and that nature um, so that's the best I can answer that question there is no individual contract for us yeah yeah but we were not a permanent department now we are a permanent department right so before the contract it basically the unwritten rule was you only exist in the consent decree right if the consent decree goes away and there's no permanent commission then you may be at risk of being laid off right but we're, we're not there anymore so um, the kids now the commission is permanent right so so uh, these staff are protected civil servants in that way and again it's turnkey work so there would be no reason to that I can think of to just say let's start from scratch because that would put all the work on you to do the turnkey operational stuff right and then um, fill those positions um, so that answer your question yeah. okay <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna that's what I'm waiting on to finalize and we will get those we do not but I will send them out um, yeah and and the way and what it is now is mine looks like exactly almost like the executive director that is in 115 right because basically we took that and put it into 115 uh, and f made it, it real powers under the law with adding some additional powers the other ones are um, Shelley's titles community engagement right so we have a community engagement person that's what they do they're out in the, they're out there representing you um, organizing with groups going to meetings there's so many meetings right she's one person we can't get to them all Ryan is a, uh, a research and policy analyst, um, so that's what that job is, and it would be akin to whatever you could think of, you know, researching best topic issues, uh, uh, best practices, what's going on in the world, you know, looking at data that we do through surveys and stuff like that. Ryan will analyze that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Sarah handles the, the print, the marketing, communications, the social media, all that stuff. So we're set up like, like most shops are. Right, uh, but I do have a concern that the volume of work, uh, based on what 115 is. I mean, you guys have like 28 separate powers in there. Uh, so with the staff we have currently, um, there could potentially be a log jam on some of those things because we just don't have enough people. And and that's one of the things in the proposal we'll have to address. There is a there is a draft that went to Delante um, that finance changed, and I haven't seen it yet. So I made some recommendations to to see if it was feasible to come back with numbers on that and I'll be happy to share those when you when you come up with a committee that wants to discuss this in detail. Okay. So as the current is there a position that is handling um like community engagement and 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 Division of Labor, right? You guys are an oversight organization. You're not a complaint investigation body. So we have to be very clear with that. We receive complaints and due process. You're going to hear that a lot. There is a due process out there, right? So you guys have the ability to look at the complaint process as a whole, right? You can certainly audit an investigation that was something severe, like uh, the to be a Chapman incident, right? You could say, we want to do an audit of how that investigation went down, but you have to allow due process to happen. And right now, with civilian complaints, when they come, we take them to OPS because it's OPS's job to investigate that complaint specifically. Now, for compliance, we would watch that complaint all the way. You know, we would check in with that people. We would stay close to them and make sure that, that, that they're getting their due process, right? 
Um, so, so that's, we have to be very careful with that. We are not an individual complaint investigation board under 115. What we are is an oversight organization that looks at the process of complaints and um, OPS is set up and they're budgeted to do that under 115. What they were done, what happened there was the community members who wrote 115 also separated them and made them independent too. So CPRB and 115 are independent and they're, we're supposed to work in conjunction and collaboration with them as one system as best we can. So that's the best way I can explain it, right? Of course, we're gonna hear grievances. When we go out in the public, we're gonna hear a lot of them, right? And we wanna make sure that those grievances are heard. So we'll take a big picture. Let's say we hear, we go to five different community places and we see the same complaint coming at us. Then we'd say, hey, as oversight, we need to look at why we're continually hearing the same problem in all these different districts. That's certainly within our purview. But if it's an interpersonal thing like this happened to me and, and this officer, uh, an alleged, allegedly an officer did this to me, that would go to OPS because that's in their purview to do. So. Jason, before we move away from financials, uh, since the grant process seems to be pretty pending, can we just do a quick assessment? How many of the commissioners have actually worked in grant preparation before? Oh, well, that's great. Okay, good. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, and there is a second section to the manual of rules that's already drafted. So once you have a rules committee, we'll introduce it through there. It deals more with some of the complex processes like the grant dealing, um, the how to conduct a hearing, those types of things. Um, it would be overwhelming to have that right now because first you have to figure out your basic order of business and then through a rules committee you can introduce that and discuss those things and training would be helpful because some of those things that are in that manual that we drafted are, are um, like how to do a hearing and how to set up a Gary list and all those things. Like it requires some context before you can really dive into it. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get training that parallels that so at the same time and as quickly as we can we get that going. So um, with budget, you know, the general rules are lawful and ethical, responsible, and mission-oriented. Oh, there was a question. There was? Yeah. No. Sorry, I thought you raised your hand. Well, yeah, I have a question. If, basically, I have a question. If we are interested in... Oh. If we are interested in tonight, just so we can go forward and get things going in... Um, recommending an interim um, executive director. How will we do that and can we do that? Tonight? Yeah, when you get to your business, someone can introduce a motion and say, we recommend, uh, you know, this person be executive director uh, interim, right? Um, and then it would just be a, a simple majority vote. Um, so you would need a motion, a second, and a, and a simple majority. And, and tonight, since you don't have formal rules, if you're familiar with Robert's Rules of Order, it's like anything you've seen on TV or if you go to council, right? Just use those as your basis. So if someone has an idea, they introduce it as a motion, right? And then um, you can debate it. So then you have a debate. You get a second. You have a quick debate on it. And then someone will call the question. So they will call the question. And that means let's have a vote on it, right? And a simple majority uh, would prevail. All right. Uh, so meetings, this is the last important part, right? Um, we do want to, one of the goals we want to take away tonight, since it's really hard to schedule you all, is when you get to your business, is discussing a regular meeting schedule going forward, right? Um, you do, the noticing stuff, I know we talked a lot about it, but we've got that down to a science here in this office, right? We'll get public notice out. We'll go to rec centers. We'll post it on the walls. We go, Shelly's at meetings all the time. We hand out flyers, right? And one of the things I would recommend is that we do go back to the practice in the past of rotating around the city. And typically that means, you know, um, we'll work on a good rotation to get to as many different places as we can, as, as Delante mentioned, trying to touch some of those disenfranchised people uh, by coming into the place that they are. It's really hard to get community investment, but you guys are 60% are of the electorate wanted you here. So I expect that you guys are going to have some really good public meetings, right? So we would, we would do our best to get you around. I ju we just need a schedule to go around, uh, and we could plan that a year in advance where you're going to be, and we have all that time to notice, right? So, so that's what we've done in the past. This is unusual, um, the way that it worked this time, because it's new, so we had to you know, hurry up and find some schedules, but you should be on a regular schedule. You may even want to consider twice monthly meetings in the first couple months, at least until maybe April just so you can move business through faster and then consider, you know, maybe going to monthly. And that's in addition to the committee work. You know, every, there's, there's no, 
there's no way to do this without committing a lot of time, you know, and that's why leaning on the staff will be so important. We're going to make your time commitment as, as, as um, valuable as possible. That's the best way I could say it, right? Because whatever we can do for you, we will do. Um, but you, but the notice, we got that down. We just need a schedule. We'll rotate around. You know, there's different types of meetings. There's general meetings. It shows in here in the, in the rules just what the, what the process is for a general meeting, you know, what the agenda should look like, basically. Delonte mentioned there's special meetings. You can call a special meeting. You can have a committee meeting. Um, so a special meeting would be to address an issue, and the chair would say, we need to talk about this issue, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, and then the next level would be an emergency meeting. Emergency meetings would be like less than 24 hour notice. We got to get it to the media, 24 hours at best. We got to get it to the media is our, is our minimum noticing requirement. And we have to get it out, uh, have public be able to sit in on it. So an emergency meeting, when might we have one of those, right? Let's say there's a high profile incident in the community, right? Uh, and you wanted to come up with a plan to, to do your best to um, find out as much information as possible or what the commission might want to do. There's no doubt that will happen. That would be an instance of when an emergency meeting would be appropriate, right? Something happened in the community. There's tensions between the police and the community. You guys want to get together and talk about a plan for how you're going to specifically uh, uh, what your role as a commission is, right? We talked a little bit about subcommittee meetings and work group meetings. Um, this just kind of repeats that a little bit. And... Uh, Chair pro tem, meeting decorum, so those types of things here, you can't vote by proxy, and the executive director will serve as your secretary unless one's dedicated. It talks about absenteeism, tardy, all those things are in there because they've been issues in the past, right? So you do need to have some rules on when it's acceptable to miss a meeting, how many meetings you can miss before, you know, and it's really self-policing for, for you all to do that. All right, so any questions on that? So on the, in the document that you gave us, I see that there's like clearly, you go down, you can see that there's uh, $821,413 for pretty much like <coughs> salaries, benefits uh, for staff and all that stuff. Then the other half of the other on the back page is $1,265,000. And I, under, I, I see some of the stuff that's there, office supplies, things like that. Right. I just want to clarify because I see a million eighty-six four twenty-six for sub grantees. I just want to just clarify: is that m like money for grants and things like that that we would um, that we provide to the community? Yes, you guys will okay. establish a program for how to do that okay. and what your standards are through your budget and grants committee. And I'm really happy to see so many people have experience in in grant administration. So the turnkey stuff of grants we'll do. You know, we'll get the applications out, all that stuff. That's what the staff will do. You just have to give us the parameters, the timelines, and then it'll be up to the commission to review those grants, grade them, and then we'll again administer the money, monitor the performance, that type of stuff for you. So. Uh, but it still is a lot of work, uh, so I'm happy the experience is there, yeah. And, and the rest of it, so you can see here, we're very fiscally responsible. So I started government in East Cleveland, and I'm not going to go a lot in my past today because you guys are here to learn more about your work than me. Um, and I had to do a lot with nothing. So, I mean, the most we've ever spent in a year is, is very low. I mean, I don't think we've ever gone. We've co with salaries aside, right, discretionary money, hardly, hardly any at all, and we've got a lot of work done. So you're going to have a lot more money than this commission's ever had. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend it, right? We still have to be fiscally responsible with our money, right? So, all right. Um, so we do have other guests here. Um, so I want to I want to introduce um, past commissioners um, who have served with us. If they want to, if Lou, Richard, and, and Latoya want to uh, come on up. So each one of these <laughs> so each one of these yeah. each one of these individuals uh, um, have been wonderful. I can't tell you what a privilege it's been to uh, serve them, and I am a servant. So when I when I work for the commission, you know that's that's what I do. And and uh, each one of them has also served as a co-chair. So that's part of the reason why I asked them back. And Latoya Logan has a very long window. She came in 2016, so she has seen it all when it comes to this work. Uh, so I'll let them tell more about themselves. 
My name is Latoya Logan. I am a social worker. I have worked in the field. I have worked in the field of social work as a forensic social worker my entire career. So I've worked in corrections, uh, parole, probation, diversion programs, and most of the work I do is surrounding returning citizens, making sure that police reform is equitable, but also that it's a living process. So hopefully I can be helpful today. Um, I'm jealous as hell. Congratulations. Um, once a month, the second Tuesday of every month, from 11 to 12, we met with the city, the police division, and we begged. We begged for information so we could do our job. And that hour was the worst hour of my life during that period. And you have the power you don't have to go begging for information. Um, maybe I'm, if, if I may, speak out of turn. Um, you're going to find a group within yourselves who are willing to do the work and who are concerned about making sure that this consent decree ends with a different police department. It's up to you. While we've been sitting here tonight, there have been kids in the neighborhood, motorists, old ladies who have been abused by the police. If we're going to have a different police department, it's up to you. The city's no friend. All the administration wants is to get rid of the consent decree. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. Um, you're going to find a group of six or seven within your group who are committed to this. I taught this for 53 years before I came on the commission. Mr. Griffin is a former student of mine. Aisha Hardaway is a friend and colleague. But I stood on the steps of the federal court a year and a half ago with the citizens for safer Cleveland demanding the then monitor to step down and questioning whether Judge Oliver was really upstairs. Um, it's up to you if we're going to, this is our last chance. There's a book of a hundred years of trying t to change the police in Cleveland and the efforts and the, the blood and the tears and it's really up to you. The, the city will be no friend of yours. And don't get bogged down in the money. Um, get someone to recommend to you how to spend that money. You could spend all your time on the money, but that's not going to change the police. All right? Um, I. I had some wonderful colleagues, and you will find some of your own, I hope, within this group. You'll also find some free riders. Um, you guys are getting paid, not very well, but you're getting paid. And those who are free riders can be asked to either earn their money or make room for someone else. As to this book, don't be daunted by it. I never read it. Um, <laughs> let me just tell you, we had the greatest staff, and Jason is the greatest executive director. It takes time. He wears on you. But 
<laughs> he knows this book better than anyone in the city, and he's the one who'll keep you out of trouble so that you can focus on the substantive things of change. This is our last time. The mayor wants you shut down. Seven years. Well, they haven't changed. And this administration hasn't done a damn thing to make them change in the past year. I couldn't even get a half an hour with um, Mark. Um, so it's up to you. And you know what? Your only friends are the citizens for a safer Cleveland, and they won't always be your friend because they won't always think you're doing enough, going far enough, going fast enough. Um, don't hesitate. I agree, disagree with Jason to use the press. You know, it's frustrating when you give a great interview and they only use one sentence or something. But it's your way. You represent the citizens of the city of Cleveland. You're the ones who are going to make change and use the press as, it, as you get used to what's going on. I'm sorry I've taken so long. <laughs> no, thanks. Please. <laughs> All right, I'll try and be a little uh, oh, I also shorter. Say, uh -oh. Wanted to say, <laughs> um, I'm retired. I volunteer anytime you need some, what I can do for free. I'm not looking for a grant or anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So my name is Richard Jackson. I former Cleveland police officer, I was a sergeant with the Cleveland police. I worked with Jim back in the days of my early years on the job. And my older brother, of course, is retired. He spent 43 years on the job. And my dad was on the job in the Huff riots and so on and so forth. So of those 100 years of, uh, of problems here in the city, I can say that my family has actually had to see it firsthand. Um, and I'm only telling you about one side of my family, the police side, but there's also another side of my family who had to, uh, who had to endure the other side of that. Mm -hmm. But for at least the last 55 years, we've actually seen the problems from outside the police department and from within. Um, as a former uh, commissioner here and co-chair, and this is my partner as, when I was first uh, voted in as a co-chair, we work very good together. And we used the co-chair model because it really helped us. Um, I actually had the mindset that some of the, some of the policies <coughs> that we were working on with the consent decree, that as a sergeant, I didn't take one of those desk jobs. I actually still worked on the street. And I wanted to see how those policies actually worked on the street for the day-to-day -day officer, the day-to-day -day supervisor. I wasn't going to give you what everybody was telling you from the from the ivory tower of the chiefs and deputy chiefs. They want to make sure that their policies you know, look good, of course, because they're in it for a political reason. Well, we're in it for life. So we had a totally different mindset. So when we come here to actually build out a policy, I would test it on the street. My officers would test it on the street. And we go through that whole process because this was, this was a life thing. But in doing that, <clears throat> it took a lot of time to do that, but we still needed to be here. So working as co-chairs, we often uh, took different things on. She would take on some parts of the administrative roles. I would take on some parts of the administrative roles. And I can tell you, working 60 hours a week in the police department, I was still putting in another 20 hours here a week as a co-chair. Um, and that's with having an outstanding partner like this by my side to help. And that's also with having Jason and this amazing staff. So. There is a lot of work to get done. And um, in addition to all of that, I actually wanted, was one of the original writers with the Citizens for a Safer Cleveland to help write Issue 24 and help write this new law to bring you guys to fruition. What Lou was talking about, 
that first Tuesday of every month over there, you, it was painful. It was painful. Um, if you guys think about the consent decree, I believe it's paragraph 17D, which gives the, gave the uh, body, our body, the power, the authority rather, to oversee all civilian oversight, which means that we can say, hey, let us audit some books here and let's look and see what you've been doing for the last month or so. No, you're not getting that. Well, the consent decree says we're supposed to have it, so we're not giving it to you. And we just had to live with that, did we not? It took us 19 months to get, finally get the report on the death during a police motor chase of Tamia Chapman in East Cleveland. We were lied to. It took Judge Oliver finally to say, we should get the report. But every month I argued with the chief, with the deputy chief, and with the law director, and with the coordinator. Yes, and the deputy chief as well. And yeah. the coordinator was was there to make sure we couldn't get it and do what we were. So as you can see, some of the things that we all went through, we all made sure that you guys don't have to. A lot of things have already been written for you. When I started, we didn't even have this book. Um, by the time we had the second, uh, iter well, at least my, my second iteration of the board is when we actually put a book together, which was only half this size back then. And so now it's grown because we've been so much more work that's been done since then. Uh, all of this stuff is a, is a roadmap for you because a lot of us didn't have those roadmaps and there was sort of trial and error to get you to this point. Um, a lot of that wasn't just us co-chairs working together, but also our staff. I remember I was sitting here and someone was asking about the writing uh, process. Well, if you're working in harmony, you really won't have to worry about a lot of that because you have an amazing staff. You can write out your notes and have them prepare the first drafts for you. These are things that are there for you so that you don't have to do a lot of that stuff because your work needs to be right here in this room working together as one, as one group. When you start to break off into your different, um, your different groups, your work groups, you'll find that there are people out there, I mean, who would command $300 an hour for the work that they do, and they came in here and worked with us for free. I can tell you there was, uh, under Section 345 of the Consent Decree, talks about the discipline, which is one of your primary things there. You'll see that it states that if the city decides to make a new general police order in any year, then they're supposed to come to you prior to making that order so that you can review it first and make your notes on it. Well, I can tell you clearly they did not follow that section of the consent decree. They just made their order. And then two days before it go, goes into effect, hey, you guys want to look at this real quick? Give us your endorsement. Yeah, it's, it's not supposed to go that way. Um, this way, you guys can actually build out that process. But you're really going to see that people will come out of the woodworks to work with you to work with you for free. I remember she was on our CPE, our, on, our, on our, um, our other uh, policy unit that we were talking about. What was it? Uh, please remind, remind me. I know I, CPOP, yeah. CPOP. I was going to say CPO, CPOP, right. But uh, in any case, that one took a long time to do, um, and she was really helped out. We had people from uh, Case Western Reserve, I believe there was a professor, who actually wrote employment law, who helped us in the disciplinary um, GPO that we were writing. So you're going to find people that's going to work on your groups. you got to put in the work. you got to put in the work. There are people at the universities, CSU and Case, who want to help, who are ready to come in. Um, who was the woman from the um, School of Social Science, who basically wrote 
the policy on juveniles and LGBT. Oh, Celeste, Celeste, Celeste right. Um, so call on us, call on the universities. Um, and there are other people besides the universities. Yeah, don't get tangled up in that grant money. You could spend all your time on that, but your time has to be spent on changing the police department. Right, and with that, I, I do want to caution you. I know that you're going to be, as far as the public life goes, after 30 years of being there, everything you do will be scrutinized. And since you guys are the first iteration of this, with the powers to enforce the, and to enforce it, they're going to be looking for you. I, I want you to understand that. You will be looked at, looked for, you know, but you guys are like the top 1% of, of, uh, of everybody here in Cleveland. And so I'm sure you guys have had some situations with that. But um, can, while Lou says, you you, use the, he says use the, pup, use the uh, media, I say be cautious about it because uh, after 30 years of being a police officer, I can tell you, you can say one thing and that two, two sentences will be taken out of context and used to say that you said this. You've got to be careful because we all depend on you. You guys have been chosen to do this job. We've spent blood and tears to write this and go through all of this to make sure that you guys got here. Now you guys are here, and we're hoping for you guys to succeed. And if you allow, if you allow them to do that to you, because they'll try and take you out individually, you 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 you'll you really kill this whole process. So don't fall for that. Also, please do not fall for the symptomatic issues. You're going to see people come out to you and talk about, oh, we need to deal only with, we need to deal with this specific thing of what the police are doing. Well, that's a symptom. Like a cold, you have a, you have a sniffle, a sniffle or whatever. You need to understand that you have to go to the source. And it's not always this top-down thing because everybody thinks, well, if you get the chief to say this or whatever, then that's going to fix the problem. It doesn't work like that, folks. It doesn't work like that within a police department. People at the top will tell you that because they don't want you to go through the whole process. But if you, you really need to be able to pinpoint where the problems are and change the culture, not just change the symptom. So with that, I want to let Latoya say one more thing before we turn it back over to Jason. Are you sure? Yes. You're on a roll, honey. Good Lord. Say what you no, say. I'm not going to. I would rather you ask questions because I talk all day and I would rather like, not waste the words. But I will say this. Read the book. Lee, I mean, Lou does civil rights law. He's been litigating for years. If that's not your bag, then you need to read the documents because that's not your expertise. Read the documents. There's no way for you to catch up on seven and a half years of work without you reading the documents. That's first. Second, have some humility. Okay? <laughs> There's a lot of work went into this, okay? A lot of work. None of these documents in front of you are wasteful, are useless, and were derived because we were just didn't have anything better to do. All of us worked multiple jobs, some of us more than we should have, and put in hours upon hours upon hours, put our own money and resources into ensuring that this work was done. The third thing I want to say is there's some things that you should, I think, read that go before, like some of the most recent years that would give you an indication of really what you can do. There was a focus group that was facilitated by the monitoring team and an outside resource. It was done in 2016. Please read it because they actually talked to police officers about what their issues were with police reform and how they felt about safety and what they felt needed to happen in order to not just make the streets safer for civilians but for themselves. There's a lot of officers who literally are like, this isn't working for us and we need to do better. Another report I would encourage you to look at is a study that was done by the outside source of jail incarcerated men who were in the jail and they went in and talked to them about police brutality and arrest and what they thought was necessary to improve policing so that you wouldn't have these shakedowns you wouldn't get intimidated you would feel free that this this system that we have not only enforces law and order but protects and serves so I would encourage you to read that and Jason and the staff will make sure they get that information for you and then the last thing I want to say is you know this this work for me is hard work you know, I, I have 
lost a lot of my clients in the streets, but I've lost a lot of clients due to poor policing. Mm -hmm. Just a lack of support, a lack of engagement, um, quick to make decisions. We invest so much money in the policing of black and brown communities, and we don't invest enough in really understanding why is the relationship that way. And so I'm not going to stand up here and complain because I'm a blessed person, but I will say this. If there's something specific you want to know about, my areas that I focused on was accountability, training, discipline. I can help you with those things if you have specific questions. I want to make sure that's clear, like not a general, but a specific question. I'm happy to assist you with that, and I will open this up to whomever at this point. Um, we worked hard, even before I was a member of the commission, writing the um, police order on search and seizure. And we argued for days with the division and Judge White, um, line by line. And it, there's a lot of improvement in there, but there's a lot that they rejected. Because at the end of the, the road, they could accept or reject what we proposed. You guys can change those things. Is there any questions for them? We're opening up to questions. I just want to make a quick comment. I want to thank you for bringing uh, these previous commissioners to the meeting. I have sat and watched you all in a meeting. And Latonya, I ask for you. Latonya, I ask for you I, because I was just so impressed with what you all were doing. And I, and I realized that you were functioning as an advisory rather than someone with statutory authority. I saw you. I, I saw each of you in that space doing what you are admonishing us to do. And, and so I just wanted to say thank you for your testimony. Um, did you write an editorial? You yeah. didn't write an editorial. It was a policeman that wrote an editorial. <laughs> didn't you write that editorial? I, I, I thought you wrote that. I was just so impressed by that because you were very honest in saying you thought one thing coming in and then experiencing the work of the commission you changed what you had thought coming in the door. I, I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, guys. Uh, yes, sir. I just, um, just to piggyback off of that, Jan beat me to the punch. I really <coughs> want to say that I think that um, I just walked in here with an open mind, not knowing what these four hours would sort of look like, but you're statements are impactful um, you know I just can't wait until I can get your age so I can say whatever I want to say wherever I want to say but there's really not like the right words that I can find for the appreciation that I feel right now um, for you all just to tell us about your experiences for you to offer support um, and that even though you know the commission that you were on is being replaced with us. I do feel a sense of unity and solidarity. And, mm -hmm. you know, people say they want to help you all the time, but I genuinely feel <coughs> that you guys are support um, and assets for us. So I really want to say thank you um, for everything that you all shared. There were all different perspectives, and that was great. Well, thank as well. you for what you're going to do. Yes, definitely. Thank you. I'll just say thank you for doing the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> it's not over. <laughs> Ditto to all the sentiments that were just echoed. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, actually, I'm going to stick to one. What would your advice be for the first 90 days, now that we're together, of what we should focus on, what you just, in thinking about specifically this period where we're coming together and getting started, what advice do you have for us? I can tell you the very first thing you, you guys need to work on are your rules, your internal structural rules, what you're going to do, and finance. Your finance is coming up very soon, the budget. That was one of the things they used against us when we needed to use the money. We had to say, well, we have this so much in our budget. Can we use this? No. 
no, you can't. Well, you guys don't have to do that. You, you're going to tell them what you have. You're going to tell them what you're going to use and what you're going to use it for. And they can't tell you, tell you yes or no, but you need to make sure that you get down there for that hearing. I believe it's coming up, was it March, um, when they have the first hearing? And uh, you, you have to have your numbers solid. Additionally, the other key is that you make sure that you guys need to vote collectively on what the salaries for your staff should be. Um, one of the things they did to us, we did try and increase the salary by doing a, a vote. I think I was in New Orleans at the time when we did that vote, but um, there was a whole lot, yeah. There was a whole lot to happen with that. But you guys have the option to actually writing what you want to pay your, your staff. This is important because you're going to find that there are other for the same cat for the same uh, classification within the city, you're going to find that people in the city and other departments who are classified the exact same as your staff are getting paid fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars a year more than what your staff is getting, and they're doing twice as much work. And I can tell you that from thirty years in that police department and seeing the work over in City Hall, I can tell you they are getting paid a whole lot more. So. You got to look at it at a reasonable rate, but they definite, you definitely want to keep your staff, and the only way to keep people these days is to pay them accordingly. So, do you have anything to add? First 90 days? So, I would say I know that you're coming in and you've heard a lot of things because everybody has an opinion, right? which sucks. Uh, and so everybody has an opinion about people and what should happen. I would say don't make any significant changes in the first 90 days. This isn't a disrespectful comment. I don't think you know enough about what has happened to start changing things and implementing new things. Um, I have worked with the staff for a very long time. And I can tell you, I was at that those first meetings about the wages. And we tried to get the salaries increased. And there was nothing we can do. In fact. Jason, you don't mind me no, sharing, okay. Share <laughs> so our, when we went through this process of bringing staff on, um, because when I started as a commissioner, we had no staff, we selected and we had a nationwide search for executive directors, really for every, every position that was here. And our first select, Jason was number two, our first select was an attorney, a black woman out of New York. And the salary she asked for was $91,000 to match the salary she was getting in New York and she was going to relocate. And that's why that salary is what it is. It isn't because Jason is just great, which you know you are. I think you are. But that wasn't what it was about. And when we tried to renegotiate, the city was unwilling to do so. So I know you're hearing things that he determined the salary. He had nothing to do with that. The commissioners advocated, did the work, tried to do what we could do to increase everyone's salary. We just never had the power to do so. The second thing I would say about rumors is your staff works really, really hard. And I know that people have their picks of who they want to be a part of the commission. And a lot of that has to do with politics. And I'm not a political person. I don't enjoy it. I despise gossip. And I, I disconnect from that. You have to find a way to do that, to learn these people on your own. These people have gone through so much in this last year, waiting on you to come aboard. All of the negativity, the disrespect, the dismissal, the everything, and they've taken it on the chin and continued to work to make sure that when you got here, you were okay. And I, I just find, because I'm in this world and I keep hearing all this stuff and it really ticks me off because these are these comments are coming from people who weren't there at the beginning who weren't in these meetings and they really don't know they're just jumping to conclusions about things so I would encourage you spend the first 90 days really understanding the roles of each of your staff understanding what their skill set is what they need because they need a lot they really have been abandoned by the city in the last year so you have a great responsibility because yes you're ushering in police reform but you're also supervising people which means you are taking care of people and you're taking care of families and and that has to be just as important as the work that you're doing on the commission to move for p police reform. And then, I'm going to say again, please read. <laughs> you know what you don't know. And you, okay. So read. And if you need Jason, and I think uh, Sarah did this, they did these like little cheat sheets, these one pagers to tell you what this document was about to highlight the points. Please read them. You know, again, humility um, is just so, so important. Our commission died election day 2021. 
We won, but suddenly our commission was dead. Nobody would answer the phone. So these guys had to hold the fort. Um, I'm speaking tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock to the UCI Safety Committee. And I called Jason and Ryan and asked them for work that we had done <coughs> before the city decided we were no good. Um, and, and that work that we did then, I'm going to use finally tomorrow when I talk to this group. So what you do is going to have a lasting effect. And I, in addition to all of this, start thinking about what substantive issues you want to see the commission address. You're not ready tonight to make those decisions. But in three months, you've got to be working the substantive issues as well because they're going to try to put you out of business. Say that, as much as I love Mark, his job is to end the consent decree. And you've got to resist that. All right. Um, in the interest of time, these, I could tell you they will be available to you. So, like, they'll be here for future trainings. Each one of them have other experiences specific to the work they've done that we could follow up with. So thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure to work with all of you. I look forward to continue working with you. Just real quick, one last question. Like, just real quick. Yep, yep. Just because we have to figure this out. How often did you meet? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, please. So as a co-chair in a committee, um, chair and the training review liaison, I had at least, I mean, no less than probably six meetings a month, no less. Uh, and as a whole commission, and then that doesn't even include the public meeting that we would have. So it's a lot of meeting because you, you again, you got to know stuff. You can't talk about training if you don't go and observe a training. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things I could tell you, but don't, you know, jump out there. So it was a lot, a lot of investment, a lot of time. Uh, to learn in order to give the information to the community. Hi, Dr. Anderson again, um, Executive Director of the Police Accountability Team. I appreciate the comments that were made, um, and I just want to note that um, to Mr. Liu's point, with all due respect, please do not resist getting out of the consent decree. The consent decree was created for the Department of Justice or by the Department of Justice done in, that did an investigation that noted that there were um, inadequacies with the police department. And we want to move forward to correct those inadequacies. And I want to work with you all to move forward through that process. So through the process of resisting the consent decree, resisting Judge Oliver, um, I'm not sure that we want to start off on that foot. I don't want to start off on that foot with the commission. And so I just want to move forward with making sure that you all have a balanced message today. Thank you. All right. All gas, no brakes. Um, OK, so, so moving right along. Um, this, this next segment, and this will be before we um, go into uh, some kind of final business things um, before, we, before we get you guys out of here. Um, but, but another conversation that, that we, you know, have always thought was crucial um, to, you know, to, to this first meeting is, is engaging with the framers of Issue 24, um, is, is having the opportunity to, um, to hear from those who from, from more of those who, who put in the work, um, who put in the work to, to make this happen, right? So as I mentioned to you earlier, right, this commission is here out of a community need and concern. Um, and so, you know, when the previous commission didn't have the, the authority that it, that it needed, the teeth that it needed to be able to, to enact change, um, you know, this, this group came together and, and set the blueprint, right, for, for, for this to be able to exist. And so, 
Um, you know, I, I want to now introduce uh, some of the members of Citizens for a Safer Cleveland um, to, to come and, and, and join me up front. Um, Ms. Brenda Bickerstaff. Um, it's Alicia Kirkman, Latanya Goldsby, Kareem Hinton. I want to sit down and bring some chairs. Oh, you want me to sit down? I want to sit down. Okay. Do any of y'all want chairs? Are you guys? No, that's, that's what we were just talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so there. Um, you know this this you know i've had the opportunity to 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 work with these folks um you know we we have not always agreed but but that's that's how that's what democracy looks like right um and so but we we are invested in in the same cause um and that's and that's police reform and we want change and and you know we wanted you to hear it directly from them you know voices um community voices who have been directly impacted um in in the most fundamental uh ways and so um, so I wanted to have a, 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 a one of one the first of many conversations, um, you know, with this group. And there's some things that you know I, I want them to share. There's specific things that I want you guys to hear. Um, and of course, you know, to the extent that you guys have questions, et, et cetera. So um, that being said, why don't we start? Uh, just kind of pass the mic down, and you guys can um, introduce yourselves and, and kind of just share briefly, um, you know, how and why you got involved in, in police reform work. So, real quick, or do you all the questions or Dr. just just a, just the first one? So yeah, so just, just the first yeah, one. so just introduce yourself, um, explain you know how and, and why you got involved in police reform, and then as the mic comes back, then we'll just do it that way. This will be real. This will be real quick. Um, I'm pretty much. Uh, my name's Kareem Hinton. Uh, <clears throat> I'm one of the organizers with Citizens for Safer Cleveland. Um, one of the original people or the four people who pulled the petitions to get the signatures, help get this job done. That's why you're here. And I thank you all for being here. I'm inspired and empowered by the spirits of Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams, and Tamir Rice. That's why I'm here. There was a lack of support for justice, but a lot of activity to keep police unaccountable. That's supposed to change here right now with you guys. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. Thank you. Um, my name is Latanya Goldsby. I am the president of Black Lives Matter Cleveland, also a member of Citizens for Safer Cleveland. Um, but more importantly, I am a family member who has directly impacted by police murder. Um, my 12-year-old cousin, Tamir Rice, was murdered by police in November of 2014 uh, at Cudell Recreation Center. We're all familiar about Tamir's story. Um, Tamir is why I'm here. Uh, it's been eight years. Uh, we just celebrated Tamir's, well not really celebrated, but mourned Tamir's, the loss of Tamir this past November, made eight years. So, um, yeah, Tamir is what got me off the couch and involved. Um, been active since 2014. Our chapter was created the year after this city decided not to charge Timothy Loman and Frank Rimbeck with the murder of Tamir Rice. My name is Alicia Kirkman. I am the president, founder of the Angelo Miller Foundation. Um, before my son was murdered in March, March 23rd, it would be 16 years, I was always active in the community. I was always a person that cared about people. I was always active. But what really brought me here with um, Citizens for Safer Cleveland, we sat in the same seats like you all, but on a different floor, because we wanted accountability. You know, my son was murdered 15 and a half years ago. No accountability, no investigation, but a settlement. And the settlement was according to what the city felt my son's life was worth. And my son was 17, and it hunts me every day. You know, it's only a few of us in the city of Cleveland that even have the strength to fight the way we fight. It's over 100 families in the city of Cleveland that have been affected by this. But I thank God for his grace and mercy to give me strength, to give us strength to even come up with the idea to pick another commission board that has stronger teeth, that could fight for us, to help us fight. 
So I thank you all. And all I want is you all to be fair. It's to be fair. Everybody life matters. Mm -hmm. You know, my son was 17. Never should he have been gunned down like that. And you heard him on the 911 tape saying, I fear for my life. No, no, I'm sorry. My hands are up. I swear to God, I don't got nothing. I ain't doing nothing. So the officer claimed he feared for his life. But he didn't fear for his life. My son feared for his life. And my son is the one gone. So like I say, please be fair. You know, I pray to God there don't be no more killing in the city of Cleveland. I pray to God that we all come up with a reform, that we can work together. So y'all won't have to be put to the test. But when y'all have to, please be fair. Because every life matters, okay? Thank you. And my son's name was Angelo Miller, if I didn't say that. He was 17. Thank you. Bring the bigger staff, my brother Craig, bigger staff. Matter of fact, it'll be 21 years on the 26th of this month. I was here when the first, one of the first consent decrees was here, but it wasn't with a judge. It was a recommendation that the Department of Justice did. And the Cleveland Police Department threw it in the trash. The consent decree was here when her son got murdered. Same thing, threw it in the trash. So at the end of the day, I've been fighting for 21 years for justice for him and his memory, but the legacy, the things will get better. So I'm telling you, it's been a long, a long road for me. A long road for his two daughters, Kanisha and Arabia. I put them on FaceTime when they was uh, swearing you guys in, and uh, Richard Jackson was talking to one of them. So I'm just telling you, now that you're sitting in the seat that you should be in, I'm not going to give y'all no breaks. I'm going to keep it real with you. I suspect for you to do a good job. I suspect for you to read, 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 just like Latoya said. I suspect for you to not to jump out their feet first. I suspect for you to not to run to the media for every little thing that they want to reach out to you for. Be careful. Absolutely. They will take that information and turn it around. I'm telling you, lawsuit is waiting on you. They want to sue. They don't want you here. And I can say that, and I know that. I work with the legal profession. I was wrongfully indicted. I'm a private investigator with a dirty cop in 2012. And he was sleeping with a victim in the case I was working on. And when I pulled his text messages, and this is for real, you can Google it. I pulled his text messages. He had been sleeping with victims for the last six, seven years. He kept his job. He was fired, but he kept his job. He should be in the penitentiary. He should not have been back on the job, but he was. And no disrespect, Mr. Griffin, because we got a city, we had a city who believed those type of cops should remain on the job. And they should not. Cops that murder people should not. So that's why I'm at, and I'm, being, I'm not being funny, I'm keeping it real with you. I suspect we, all of you to do a good job. I suspect for all of you to be fair down the middle on either side. I suspect for you to not to go out here talking about cases when they come across your desk. People call you, I have nothing to say. No comment. Because let me bring something to you. OR revised code 2933.52 said that you could be recorded without a knowledge of knowing it. So you better be careful because the things you say could be recorded and it could be used against you. I do it every day when I'm going out investigating cases. I record people because for my protection. But when they record, it's for them to put you in a bad fight. So what I'm saying, how can I say this? Stay wise as a serpent and humble as a dove. I'm going to leave that with you.
Thank you, thank you. Um, so, so next question, and and you guys actually kind of touched on um, the next thing I was going to ask you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward. Um, you know, we've talked about community engagement and, and how that's important to, to this process, right? So it's not just the voices of the commission, but making sure that it, it encompasses the, the community at large. Um, so, you know, any advice on how the commission can keep the community engaged in, in its work um, going, going forward? So whoever well, wants to. You want to go first? Um, so one of the things that I would say is to continue to support community engagement and community input. Um, a lot of times, so, well, for instance, this board was created because the community was not allowed to have input. And so we want to make sure that, you know, there is op opportunity for us to engage with you all. Sometimes you're going to have to meet us where we are, not just us coming to you, but be present in the community. Um, show up to community-led events organized by folks that look like us, not just city officials and county council people, but dig into the grassroots that's here in Cleveland and use them. Um, they experience police brutality, police violence. Um, they know what it looks like and how it shows up in your community. So attend more community-led events sponsored by community activists and organizers in the community. Make your presence felt. <laughs> In the interest of uh, just being as brief as possible, knowing that they're pretty much going to say how I'm feeling on that, um, I don't want our time to be cut short in a way where we don't convey the message that we want. So one, the question that he skipped, number two, was from your perspective, why was issue 24 so important? What was it supposed to accomplish? And I wish to answer that. The importance and purpose of issue 24 was around accountability because we've witnessed police chiefs, public safety directors, uh, and public safety directors allow little to no justice to occur. Issue 24 puts citizens in a position to bring about accountability, change, particularly change in police culture for the good, and to bring about better practices. And the better practices portion has so much to do with the policies that you guys will help shape and implement when we're talking about culture like you want to talk about real change when folks know that they're going to be held accountable watch them make changes so i'm counting on y'all again thank you um just engage with the community go out to community events you know um go to the recreation centers you know um, get involved with the youth you know, because that's my biggest thing is saving our future. You know, like soon my son was murdered. You know, he was murdered in uh, March 2007 on the 23rd. In the month of August, I start giving back to the community. You know, I start going out there engaging with our youth, you know, in low income, you know, and I made sure I was there, you know, to go coach them, to tell them my story about my son. You know, and on the flip side, the year before, my only brother was murdered by gun violence. So to me, gun violence is gun violence. You know, if your child was murdered by someone in the street or if they was murdered by the police, it was still gun violence. So just go out and engage with the community. I'm gonna just keep saying transparency, transparency, transparency read your information i did this not only for my brother but for people who've been wrongly convicted also mm -hmm. they lived i lived through what the police did to me <coughs> but, don't forget about them yeah. you have people i'm working on five wrongful convictions right now where people are in prison for crimes they didn't commit and you don't realize this but when a person gets out of prison for something they didn't do they have PTSD, but guess who paying for that? We paying for it. I want to start letting that money go into our communities. The people that's most affected by these police misconduct is in the urban cities. Go around and look in our city. 105 St. Clair, dilapidated. 
Look at these cities. Look at Wade Park. Look at Superior. It's dilapidated. We don't hardly don't have any wives in our area for our young people to be able to go in there and do things that's constructive. We have to do better. And I'm, again, I'm going to keep saying transparent, keep reading, and stay with this. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm going to be watching you. And just because I may not be around every day, I'm going to be knowing. Trust and believe that. Because I'm nosy. <laughs> um, so, so you guys kind of touched on some of the challenges, um, you know, that, that the commission will likely face. Um, you know, any, any expand on that, right? Like what, what challenges do you see this commission facing um, in, in doing its work and, and thoughts on how they have overcome those challenges? Sorry, with, with Alicia, just, uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be honest. There's a lawsuit waiting for you. And it's waiting for you to make a wrong decision. And I'm going to keep pressing that because I want it in your head. You got to keep reading. You got to keep focusing. You got to get a lawyer that's independent from the city. So they can advise you. Now let's be honest. Anybody can sign by a lawsuit. Don't mean they're gonna win. But I want you to be so tight in what you do. That's the way I want the police to be. I want that reform to be so tight, so constitutional. The stops being perfect. Okay? So we don't have these issues. We have to work together and it has to be done. Um, one of the challenges that, well, one of the biggest challenges that you're probably going to face is pushback, um, whether it's from the union, whether it's from the city, um, from those who don't support transformative police reform. Um, again, we're attempting to change the culture of policing in Cleveland. It took us 100 years to get here. A hundred years they have attempted to try to reform the Cleveland Police Department. And whether it was sabotaged through internally or through the union, what have you, they weren't able to accomplish it until now. That's why you all are here. Um, yeah, pushback will probably be one of the biggest issues that you face, whether it's from the union. But I say stand, stand firm and stand fast and understand that you have the community who voted you in behind you. Utilize the community. We're here for you. Real quick, um, <clears throat> I'm going to say um, I want to caution you that bringing accountability is not anti-police, but it's actually pro-community. Yes. You'll have members of the community, members of law enforcement, and so forth that are going to sometimes come and pressure you. That's that pushback. It's going to be coming through propaganda, trying to shed you in a perhaps a less positive light. Mm -hmm. Just remember who you're working for. You're working for the community, not the administration, not law enforcement, but for the community. And this piece right here is really vital. Regardless of who asked you to be on this commission, who helped you to get on this commission, get support to be on this commission, you are here for the community. Remember that. If, if many of you are concerned about your legacy, understand now, this part of your life is an open book. You got the right folks watching what's going on. And this isn't a threat. This is just a reality of like where we're at. And you know, it, just understand that your life on regarding this is an open book mm -hmm. and part of your legacy is going to be if you were here for yourself, for whoever helped you get here, or if you were here for the community. Resume builder. <laughs> right, um, so, so last thing I have and then, then I'll open it up um, and also for, for any final thoughts. Um, so, so we talked about challenges. Um, you know, 
there, there's there's a lot that's happened right in the, in the last you know two years mm -hmm. right um, you know if you can touch on you know what positive things that you've seen happen and how can the commission build on that to, to continue to continue that trend um, so we'll start let's see if we started Alicia yeah all right hey so something that positive happened was issue 24 passed Yay! So that's why you all you all are here, and that's that's the most positive thing that happened that I saw in the city of Cleveland in the last two years. That's it. Well, I want to have to say this: Richard Jackson helped us quite oh, yeah. a bit. Yeah. He stopped us from getting arrested at City Hall. <laughs> When we was down there protesting before, but we was creating it because we had a lot of pushback. We had one councilman that backed us, Joe Jones. One, Joe Jones. And they didn't, you know, the councilman, they didn't want it. They didn't want it. But and Richard Jones, I mean, Richard uh, Jackson, I have to really thank you because he was still a police officer. He was still working. And he was going up against the grind. They was coming at him left and right. Like, why are you doing this? You uh, you blue, you this, you that. But he kept on rolling, and he kept on rolling. He was out there with us uh, collecting signatures and things of that nature. He really helped us. He really did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I got to thank you for that. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> thank you for not letting me get arrested. <laughs> um, I would say that, some, like, some of the positive that I see is that you know, the pro commission that was here before you have laid the blueprint. Yes. So you have a guiding guidelines or guiding principles that you can follow that can help you build the foundation that you're trying to set now that you're established as the commission. So I would just, you know, encourage you to fall back on that. Um, lean into it, learn as much as you can from their experiences and the things that they've done through because you're going to experience some of the same things. The pushback is real and it's coming. Um, and you could, you know, definitely benefit from some of the ways in which they responded and reacted to some of the pushback that they received as, as members of the commission. So I would just say, you know, step into those footsteps with, you know, pride and, and fall back on those relationships and, and, you know, you guys will persevere. Exactly. Positive change changes with regards to police reform that has happened here. You're it just in a nutshell. You guys are it. Now, and you guys are the only substantive, substantive thing that I can say has happened here in regards to police reform. Hasn't happened on the part of the city. Hasn't happened on the part of the federal judge, Solomon Oliver. Hasn't happened on the part of the police chiefs, mayor, current mayor, former mayor. Current mayor's doing some stuff. I got to give him some credit, actually. With the budget especially. That was the biggest thing biggest thing he could have done. But, uh, but I'm going to say, like, quite honestly, you know, public safety director, same thing. Nothing good. Um, so the substantive thing is going to be coming from you guys. So you're the only positive, positive thing. So, again, counting on y'all. Love you. And remember, let me just say this one last thing. We did not apply. We could have, but we didn't. We stood down because we want this to work. Because if we would have, the focus would have been on us, not the cause and not the issue. And that was in front of you. So that's why we did. And it was hard. And it was hard. It was hard. Because we was like, I was like, Alicia, I'm, she was like, well, Brenda, don't you think we should? I, said, I don't know, Alicia. Let's not do it. <laughs> Latanya said, yeah, girl, we should get on there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> come on now. I said, come on now, the time. Come on, y'all. Let's think about it now. Think about it. And then Kareem, yeah, I think you should too, Brenda. What you talking about? But at the end of the day, we came together. We thought about it. A lot of thought. They said no. But we was on the, the Citizens Review Committee. We did that because we really wanted to work. We don't want to conflict ourselves. We still making concessions. We going to work it out. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any any questions, Trina? Um, so we do have a budget for like grants and what type of like programming or grant ideas did you guys have in mind when you put that 
into that section? Like, what things would you guys like to see? Solving some of these unsolved murders. Mm -hmm. I'm just being honest. I'm getting calls 24-7. Let's face it. We yeah. know who killed our loved ones. We got a face and a name. Some of them, don't, they don't even have names. Mm -hmm. So I really, and we talked about this when we was doing issue 24, a portion of that money going to those unsolved murders. So those people have right to get justice too. They have rights. And we want to see them get justice as well. And some of the small organizations that's out there working with our youth, I mm -hmm. think that's how some of the money should be spent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely look into looking into the underlying causes of why crime is going up. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something that this commission can look into um, and addressing those issues at the community level. Um, building out programs that will that will create um, something for our youth to do. Right now, they're lost. They have nothing. They don't have recreation centers. They, you know, they can barely get into libraries without library cards. So, like, they need real investment. Community programs is what we're looking for. Um, uh, definitely, these meetings happening open publicly. Um, but yeah, definitely community programs that addresses the issues that we're facing in our community. Housing, um, food deserts, uh, we're looking for those type of food co-op programs and things like that to be created and uh, implemented within the community. Let me first say that where we don't want to spend is on some more donuts with cops, exactly. coffee with the police, and stuff like that. That stuff is purely for show. We need real things to happen. And when we talk about real things, we're talking about things basically, and the, this is the biggest key in my opinion and in the opinion of many. We have to start with our youth. So when we start with our youth, we're teaching our youth conflict resolution. We're teaching our youth how to de-escalate because unfortunately too many times there's an expectation on our children to be the adults in the room when they're dealing with law enforcement and have to de-escalate a situation when they're not the adult in the room. So we need to teach our children, we need to have our children taught de-escalation, conflict resolution. We need to teach them about rape culture so that these, because there is an acceptable culture out there that allows for you know, people to be violated, particularly our vulnerable women out here, okay? So now, with that being said, that and more, but let's start with the youth. That's, a, I think, is a good focus uh, w that you guys should start with. Uh, yeah, oh. Oh. <clears throat> I think, oh, it's on. Um, I just really wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the blood, sweat, and tears that you guys have put into this work for making it possible for us to be here to get started and I just really want you to know that um, I can think of no greater privilege than honoring the legacy of Tamir, of Angelo, and then can you remind me of your brother's name? Craig. Craig? Craig. Craig. Mm -hmm. um, so Tamir, Angelo, and Craig then being in this position and, and I just want you to know that um, I'll speak for myself <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure that I speak for a lot of us that um, doing this work is serious because we're not, you know, doing it for it, but we're also doing it in the memory of your loved ones. And Thank you, I appreciate that. That's, and that's serious, and I just, you know, the grief, I can only imagine the grief, and for you to have gotten up and fought every day, like through that grief, I just am deeply honored to be in this position, and I hope that we can do we can take this gift that you've given the city of Cleveland and honor your loved ones. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this, this may be for you. I've been asked to speak at a couple of community events, and I want to invite some of my fellow commissioners there because when we talk about community, I'm from Southeast Side uh, community, which obviously we all are from different communities. I want them to meet my community. I want to go meet their community. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
is that can, that's not considered a meeting, right? As long as there's, as long as it's not a quorum, right? right. If more than right. seven of you and yeah. you're discussing the public <laughs> business, I don't, then it's a meeting. I don't really want to discuss anything. I want to hear from our yeah. different communities. What do they want? Right. right. I don't yeah. have anything to say yet. Right. I want to hear. Like, what do y'all want? I mean, yeah, and, 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 and I, we not encourage the same you. Community. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we encourage you, right? That That's part of the responsibilities right. of the commission is community right. engagement, right? I mean, and there's lots of mechanisms to be able to do it, and, and, and you absolutely should. should I just want to make sure that's not considered a meeting. Yeah. So once, once you decide the parameters on exactly you what you're going to do, call me, and then we'll, <laughs> yeah, okay. we'll, we'll make sure you're not yeah, violating yeah, yeah. the law. Uh, there, was, there was another hand. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so I guess we have to just figure out the distinctions between outreach and engagement events and actual meetings. Mm -hmm. Because that seemed like the, mm -hmm. what he's saying. He wants to outreach and engagement right. event, so that wouldn't right. be a meeting. Mm -hmm. So I want a, a number of us represented, not just me by myself. Mm -hmm. I want to have y'all come over and meet my community. I come meet y'all community. Yeah. There's no law against community, listening. Community There's no law against is, going to listen to the community. So right. It's at, it's at, my it's whole, like my whole thing is because sometimes I hear this in my head. You say community and people automatically think it's a hood. No, we all live in a community, yeah. a diverse Amen. community, different communities, but the major problems might be in my community. Right. But I don't know what's going on in your community because it could be some problems too that's behind closed doors. Yeah. No, that's Neighbors may right. know, but you know what I'm saying? Right. So, you yeah, know, really, really good point. Really good point. Um, any, any more questions for, for our panel? I just have a good question. I feel like I sound like a money person because it's about the grants. Again, um, I just don't know if the language, it's the language of the grants that we can, you know, give money for. Um, is there like a, like a limitation? Like, is, do we have like a little flexibility for the type of programs you know, that we were talking about? Um, you know, it's like how much freedom do we have with picking the groups? That's like, I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. So, oh, I'm sorry. So the, you're talking about the grant, the community grants. Yeah. So those proposals will come from the community. Okay. Right. And you but guys will. There's no like, you can't give grant money to this group. Like I'm, I'm trying to get it. Like I guess I have to so read. So long as there is no conflict of interest, if you're not sitting on the board of one of those groups, then they would be able to apply. Okay. So yeah, and, and you guys will come up with the process right. Right, okay. for for what that what the grant application looks like, right? And who's right. going to apply, how you're going to distribute right. it, how you're going to evaluate it, right? What types of programs, <laughs> right? So your your job essentially to, to come up with those parameters within okay. the guidelines of the charter. And, and right? one fifteen has very specific things in there that it lists, right? Correct. So right. when you establish Correct. your budget and grants committee, you can go through those okay. and then you design the project parameters around the priorities in there. It doesn't mean there's not other things, mm -hmm. but it does have some priorities in there that, that we need to be familiar with and make sure are included to stay within the law. I think it says community-based violence prevention, restorative justice, and mediation programs. I yes. think those are yeah. the so, so there. See, it's always good to go back and read exactly yeah. what it says before we spin off on ideas and things. So. All right, so that's it. I want to thank you guys for, for being here. Again, first of, first of many conversations. Um, and so, um, so yeah, much, much appreciated. And do your bylaws. I spent a week with them in Texas at a civilian oversight conference. Yes, did. We had a good time. I learned all types of stuff that week, right? That's how the rumors start, right? Um, all right, so, all right, so, so again, um, if anybody, you know, so we are, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason for, uh, for the last piece of, of today's meeting. Um, so again, um, I see Ms. Ridgeway is already doing it, so if anybody needs to, you know, stretch, <laughs> do, do, do what you need to do. But, um, but we want to get you out of here, so um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason. All right. So the rest of the meeting time is your time to practice. Uh, you know, I recommend you select a chair pro tem just to get in the habit of that, right? Go through the, go through the order of the motions to do that. And then um, it's open for business. So then it's a, you know, there are some recommendations on there that we put. But again, we don't, you guys decide what you're going to do, right? We just put those as kind of a guidepost based on what Delante had recommended and I did. It doesn't mean that you have to get to all those or you can choose the table one for the time being and introduce some new business that you want to, right? Um, so the floor is all yours now, and you can use your, you know how to use your microphone, so turn them off and on. You might want to wait until people are back so you have a, a full quorum for your uh, business discussions. 
and I and I understand and we appreciate that we're a little over time on the budget, but there are, or I mean the agenda. So even my brain is, is shifting at this point. Um, but that I think a little extra time over would be worth it if you guys want to get through some important business. Okay. Hey y'all, should we reconvene in five minutes? Okay. Okay, yeah. If it would be helpful, I but only if people like I don't feel like I need to get correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if people wanted me to, okay. okay. Mm-hmm. 
great. I think right. one thing we could do is say, why don't we elect co-chairs for three months just to get through this first period, and then at that three months we can choose to have a revote. That way if people feel like people yeah. have an opportunity to say, this is working or this isn't working, but that way we have a little continuity or just something to help move things forward. Yeah. That would that would be one suggestion. But I would I actually post it to the group of say, we want to do pro tem, like, you know, picking a new chair every meeting just to move things forward, or do we want to choose a temporary three-month co-chair? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good Oh, no, I don't think we should go to that. I don't think we should make that decision. But I'm saying as far as the trust of the chairperson or co-chairs yeah. being every month or every three months. Yeah. So maybe we just focus on the protest list. So we need someone just to facilitate. Can we get back together? Yeah. Okay. Is everybody here? Okay, y'all, I think we're missing John here. Okay, yeah, that's everybody. Hey, everybody. All right, are we back? We back. We're back. Well, oh, not yet. Almost. <laughs> I know that Terry has to leave in one minute. And yeah. So, does anybody want to be pro tem tonight? So, take on chair duties just to help move conversation forward. I nominate Chandra. <laughs> so, someone would need to second me. I'll second you. Okay. Okay. Um, I accept the nomination. I think we'd say all in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. Abstain. Okay. Motion passes. Is it somebody taking notes? Okay, great. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I want to be respectful of Terry's time because I know Terry has to leave in a, in a couple minutes. Is there anything that you feel like you want to have us discuss as the first item since you might have to leave after that? Uh, if we can discuss those uh, the central committees. Central committees, yeah. So the ones that were suggested for us were the, um, where did that little piece of paper go? Here it is. Yeah. Budget, yeah, budget and grants, rules, and then commission training, so helping facilitate our training as a commission. Are there any others that people think we should add to this list for this kind of? Outreach is missing. Hmm? Outreach is missing. Outreach? Okay, yeah. I do, I, I think that outreach would be a good one to have so that we can make sure that we're getting that plan. Does it, any any other ones or is anyone opposed to any of these? The policy one is also missing. Oh, these are just the temporary beginning ones. The um, essential ones tonight and then yep. we'll work on the others later. Yeah, so yeah. Just Rules and training, maybe. So these are different than the ones that are listed on that. Yeah, they are. Yeah, these are just like kind of like temporary ones, just to help us get started. What do you all think about rules, training, outreach? Because I do think there's a backlog work that we should start to do in trying to figure out what we want to do and how we want to reach out to the com uh, community. Community, and we clearly are going to have to prioritize um, our training. Um, and then we have to do, we have to learn the rules, like yeah. our rules. Well, I feel the, like, but the budget has to be approved. Yeah, the budget, yeah. I have a question, <laughs> I have a question yes. for the staff. I just have a question and, for the staff. Outreach. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm here for questions. Um, the question is like, the outreach piece, is that something that is sort of like, can be put in motion without a committee, or do you feel like we should have a committee that's no, looking at it right now? Anything you need with outreach immediately, we can do without a committee. So, maybe we don't need so a committee, in our mind, an outreach committee would, once you get rolling, would design a whole strategic plan for outreach that we follow okay. later as, as a goalpost, right? 
it with in conjunction with staff. That's kind of how it's worked in the past. So we'll do like a two-year outreach plan. We'll put target numbers on it, things like that. More complex than what we would do right now. I just want to make sure that by not having an outreach committee in place, it doesn't prevent us from going out. Because I just met with 13 people last week. No, we do not. It won't prevent us. Okay. As long as it doesn't prevent us from doing this work that we've always been engaged in. Okay. I'm glad that we're all excited. I would like to, as we follow Robert Rules of Order, it's important that the, we direct our questions yeah. to the chair and that she really calls on Thank us you. so that we all keep in order and we're moving our meeting efficiently. Thank you. Um, okay, so the three, it sounds like we're, uh, to summarize, we have decided to, to go with the suggestions of budget and grants, rules, and then commission commissioner training, and then but we definitely recognize the importance of outreach and want to make sure that we're dedicating time to that um, as an important uh, subcommittee in the future. Um, can I get a motion to create these subcommittees, temp like as the kind of temporary? I motion. Motion. Second. Second. Okay. So we had Kyle for the minute. Kyle motioned and Pete seconded. Um, is there any discussion, or do we feel like we're ready for a vote? I think you have unanimous consent. Great. <laughs> so like, all right. So all in favor, aye. 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 All opposed? An abstain. An abstention. An abstain. An abstain. Yeah. Abstain. Okay, great. So we have um, created these three committees. Um, I would like to see if we could do a quick sign up. So. Go ahead. Madam Chair, may I nominate myself for the Budget and Grants Committee? You sure can. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, do we need to, do we need to sign up for the Budget and Grants Committee? Yeah, I think we need to sign up for the Budget and Grants Committee. Yeah, maybe we'll, yeah, go for it through the Budget Let's just go around and see where people want to chair, if we can okay. go around and then see where we end up. That sounds great. Greg, why don't we start with you and go around. What committees would you like to be on? We're not doing outreach, right? No, not right now. Right now, it's just uh, budget and grants, rules, and commission commissioner training. Commissioner training. Commissioner training. Okay. I would like to nominate myself for the budget and grants and rules. Um, okay. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, I will be interested in commissioner's training and rules. Okay, great. I just want to make sure Charles, right? That is correct. Okay. Huh? Okay, good. All right. And you said commissioner training and rules? Yes. Okay. So are you getting all that? Okay, great. Training and rules. And then Jan? Rules. Right. Rules, okay. And James? The commissioner. Uh, I will go with the uh, commission training. Commissioner training. Operating. Sharina? Um, I'm open for training or grants. Training or grants? Right okay, you, you want to do one? Yeah. Okay, yeah. training or grants? And then, John? I would prefer grants and budget, and I'm open to uh, adding myself to the community. You said uh, grants. grants? Can you say that a little louder? Grants and budget, but if there's a need for someone on an additional committee, I will be willing to do that. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And also, do you prefer to be addressed as John or Dr. Adams? It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. And Terry? Um, I would like to be on the budgets and grants, and I'm open for either of the two. Okay, so great. another one. Beautiful, Pete. Um, I would say budget and grants, and if needed, commissions training, or either one of those two would be fine or both. Okay, great. Budget and grants and commissioner training. Amazing. Budget and grants. Budget and grants. Okay. Commissioner training. Commissioner training. Okay. And Pete. Commissioner training. Can you give us a quick addition of how many people we have on each one? More than five, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, although I think I added um, maybe some of the clothing. Yeah. And then for commissioner training, we have Greg, Charles, Jim, Sharina, John, Alana, and Kyle. Okay. So we have a few with more than five. To be fair, though, we actually don't, because we haven't adopted these um, operational and procedures, we actually don't have to follow that. So I think, you know, but I think we can just decide for ourselves do any of those committees feel like they have too many people that it might get in the way of the work. And then I'm happy to go on wherever it's needed. So which one has the least amount right now? Rules Committee has the least amount. They have three. The budget and grants and commissioner training both have 
have seven, so you would have a form at both of those. Okay. So I will put myself in the rules committee, um, and then I also am willing to add myself to another one if that's needed. So does that seven, seven, five? Four. Four? I have myself in the rules. Am I on two already? Does anybody, can you read through the um, committees one more time? Yes, of course. Rules Committee, Adriana, Charles, Jim, Chandra, Terry, Budget and Branch, Adriana, Sharina, John, Terry, Keith, Alana, Kate, and Commissioner Training, Greg, Charles, Jim, Sharina, John, Alana, and Kyle. Uh, just so we know, at, at point of uh, clarification, we don't need a quorum for those committees. No. There are some seven, but... They, they would have their own quorum. Right. Correct. Yeah, they have their own quorum, right. so we don't need a certain amount of people. And then until we adopt the rules, then we can have as many people on the committee. Does seven feel like it's going to be too many? Not for budget. I mean, <laughs> grants and budget. I think that's but good for number. the budget committee, if there were seven of us meeting, it would, it would have to be a public meeting, correct? Well, even if it wasn't public. seven people, it would still have to It's still, yeah, yeah, yeah as long committee, as... So it has to be Sorry. No, please. Thank you. No, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, no, it's a committee, so it needs to be. Right. If there's a quorum so of a committee, four. it has to be public. So yeah. quorum for a committee will be four. Yeah. If it's okay. a seven person committee. Yeah. 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 Once we form the committee, it doesn't really matter how many people are on the commission. Generally, it's the quorum of the number of people on the committee. So, is anybody on these? Did, did anyone sign up for two that feels like actually I want to move myself off one of them? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, Just go like ahead. A technicality. So, in the future, if we have a committee that has an even number, is quorum half? Or is quorum, like if there's six people, is quorum three or is quorum four? I just wanted to just clarify. Generally, half plus one, right? Yep, half plus one. <clears throat> yeah, half plus one. Half plus one. Half plus one, so it would have to be. Yeah. Okay, so. um, I think that. I, I'm just thinking I would be willing to be on the training, but I think seven is a lot, and so I think we're good with that. So the training tra 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 is also very, very temporary, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Temporary was the recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Do we want to set a time limit for how long we go in these commissions? I mean, in these committees before we. Yes. Let's say three months? That's fine. Okay. Okay. Can I get a motion for that? I move that the committee's established of budget and grants, rules, commissions, and trainings um, be meet for an uh, interim of three months. Beautiful. And then can I get a mo oh, seconded? Second. Okay. Second. Um, let's vote. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Can I also get a motion to approve the people as read by our wonderful staff member, who I'm forgetting their name? Yeah. Say that again? Hannah. Hannah? Okay, yes. as read by our wonderful Hannah um, to approve those commissioners to be on the commission, on these committees. You, motion? What's the problem? The motion, I'm, I'm requesting, oh, go ahead. The first motion was for three months. To approve the people that we went around and discussed. Hannah, do you want to read them one more time, just so everybody? So for the rules committee is Adriana, Charles, Sam, Chandra, and Terry. For the budget and grants committee, it is Adriana, Sharina, John, Terry, Keith, Alana, and Kate. And then for the commissioner training committee, it'll be Greg, Charles, Jim, Sharina, John, Alana, and Kyle. Madam Chair, I would like to make a friendly amendment that we will establish the committees set forth as budget and grants rules, commissions and trainings for the three-month interim with the names mentioned by Hannah. I accept your friendly amendment. And um, second, I think someone, the friendly amendment, then we need uh, someone to make a motion. Hmm? Well, I just made a friendly am amendment. So that kind of oh, revised that right. motion mm -hmm. to, you. you know, so that we, so basically I didn't want to make two separate <laughs> motions. Right. So I made a friendly amendment to, I mean, friendly amendment to revise that current motion so that we Excellent. can move forward. Perfect. Thank you. So does that mean we need to re-vote or are we good? 
<laughs> we, just, we, we should revote yeah. because no, no. I redid an amendment. So right. you're right. voting on the amendment now. Thank you. That's what Very I would much. say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we are going to revote. So all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 All uh, opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay, so um, for future, the next item is future scheduling. So um, <coughs> one, I think we have. We need to set a regular, or at least for right now, regular meeting schedule so that we can start blocking it off in our um, calendar so that it's a lot easier for us to get together. Um, and then we can either set together as a group the meeting time uh, for these uh, subcommittees, or we can give ourselves like two minutes for the groups. I guess we have some overlap. Um, but let's just start with the regular meeting. So a regular public meeting that's on the schedule goes out to the, you know, the public as this is, happens, however often. Um, do folks want to have a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly meeting? I think those are probably the three most likely choices. Are there any thoughts? I think the recommendation was bi-weekly, <coughs> so that's what I suggest. Yeah, the Um So so we just chime in on, on kind of the, the recommendation piece, right? And so um, some of that was also thinking about training yeah. as well, right? So not necessarily jumping into regular meetings, but yeah. putting dates on the calendar that we can, so the, the template that, that Jason gave you, the template that the division of police, right? You can break that up and plug into what you're already set, setting up yeah. to meet, right? So if you can set out ideally two larger meetings per month, Probably, I mean, I think Jason said April. I probably say June, <laughs> um, um, so that we can start this bill in. Because we're looking ideally at maybe, you know, roughly forty to fifty hours worth of training overall, right? Um, you know, give or give or take. So, so that 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 was the thought there in the recommendations that you will put meetings on the calendar, and then from there we can more definitively just put the training sessions in, right? So at your next meeting, we'll have these sessions lined up, the next one, the following sessions, and then it just rolls like that, and then we already have the dates, right? Because from our end, we're pretty much ready to go, we just need to plug them in with dates. <coughs> and are you imagining how much, oh, please, Pete. No, Chair, I just feel like it's up to the training community to really figure out what the training is, to take what's there and synthesize it and make it ours, right, as opposed to right. just doing what we're told, right? Mm. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you will need a time to be able to, so if your committees are doing work, right, they're going to have to come back to the whole. So if you have a bi-weekly schedule, at least, to have a meeting of the whole, they can bring the committee business forward and vote on that business. So, you know, at the very minimum, I would say bi-weekly, you know, two hours. And if you're going to have training, you can always extend that agenda out. So. And um, does anybody think that it should be something other than bi-weekly? No, so bi-weekly, and then um, what do folks think about amount of time? How many hours? Mm. At least two. At least yeah, two. two. Should we do three? I think we can adjust as we go. To start yeah. out two, I think is enough. Yeah. 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 Two. Two. Okay, great. So, um, for days of the week, did this is this a good day? Wednesday. Wednesday. As long as the time can change. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Is Wednesday a good day? Yeah. I was gonna say Tuesday. Tuesday or Wednesday? Is there a uh -huh. preference? I can't do Tuesdays, but it's, I, Wednesday. Um, the time. I just act that the time on Wednesday change. Yeah. What time are you? Just after business hours. So after business hours. Don't have to take off. Like work. six to eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, is anybody opposed to Wednesdays six to eight? Would people like it to be odd weeks, or, or I guess if it's bi-weekly, we do we start with this week? Maybe the second and fourth Wednesday. That might be easy to remember. Yeah, make it the second and fourth Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Second and fourth Wednesday. Okay. okay. So, so with anything, we need to put a form or motion. We probably yeah. should put a motion. So, so I, I I'd like up. someone to put forth a motion for, to have our regular meetings be the 2nd and 4th Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. 
I make a motion. Uh, second and fourth Wednesdays, two hour meetings from Tuesday to Wednesday. Okay, great. Uh, second, second anymore. Second. second. So Pete made the motion <laughs> and Greg seconded. So all. I have a question before. Oh, yes, thank you. Will we be able to utilize this office during those hours? Yes. So the office is an option, but we can also add some community involvement. Oh, so okay. You can devote a little portion of time to start listening so okay. we can rotate around the rec center okay. and stuff like that. Okay, I forgot about that. Thank time. you. So I think it's a good idea to let community start coming mm -hmm. up and give them a few minutes to just mm -hmm. talk at each one and do some listening. So. Okay. Yep. When will this start? Second and fourth Wednesday. So the second Wednesday. February. February. That would be... No, that actually the 8th, eight. February 8th. Yeah. yeah, the first is actually on the Wednesday, so. Yeah. yeah, so for February, the meetings would be February 8th and February 22nd. So, um, are there any other points of discussion or points of clarification? If we're gonna do let community come up, I would ask that we work that to the schedule so the first 30 minutes of every meeting. Mm -hmm. And if we, like maybe we could push hours back, so it'll be 2.5 hours, like 6.30 to 8.30 mm -hmm. for official business. But that six to six thirty time be for um, community engagement. If anybody wants to come and talk to us, right. so uh, sounds like a call for a friendly amendment to change yes. this, the meeting to from to six six to eight thirty. Yes, with the first thirty minutes being open public comment, and then the second six thirty to eight thirty. Right, the official business the official. training, whatever we need to get done. Yeah, yeah. I anybody opposed to that? So you said the end time will be 8.30, or are we keeping it to the, till 8? 8.30. 8.30. So, 8 30. the so really the amount of time is for it to be 2.5 hours, two and a half hours, with the first 30 minutes being public engagement time. And so we would, it goes in till 8.30. Okay. Friendly amendment accepted. Is there any point of discussion, point of clarification? Okay. Are we ready to vote? So, uh, I'll... All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, great. Motion passes. Um, so, again, for February, oh, my phone just died. It will be the 8th and the 22nd. 22nd. Um, one question I have for the group is in the development of the agenda, which committee would develop the agenda? Or do you want... Do you want to coach? Chair, do you want to co-chair somebody you can work with on that, or something like that? Yeah, right now I'm pro tem, which means I'm the chair for this right, one meeting. Good point. So, so I would mean this, yeah. I could, you, so we could nominate a chair to be the next meeting, and then they could do the agenda. Right. So, the, so the chair, uh, just a point. Uh, you could just designate one person to work with staff on the agenda. Okay, if you, want. you know, it would. You don't have to overthink it. The agendas are going to be relatively similar at each meeting. Okay. Uh, the only thing will change is guests and, and maybe training agendas, but. Okay, uh, great. Um, so I if one person just wants to be the lead on that, to work with Galante and I, will make it much smoother. Okay. Jan, I thought you had your hand up. No, but I'll, I was just gonna say, we need to work with staff on that. Right. And not do that around. Right. Do we want to nominate someone to work with um, Jason and staff and Delante on that meeting agenda? Oh, right. Should it just be whoever the chair is? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to. to we don't know who the chair will be. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we be whoever across the board? Yeah. Yeah. I think she's saying, I think Serena's saying, it could just be whoever likes this. You're I think if she wants to. So I have one proposal that that's the, 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 the temporary person to thank, thank you, John. Let's kind of um, settle down for a sec. Um, did you have something before, Pete? No, did you have your hand up? Okay, Pete. Well, I just had a thought that if we're going to have a different pro pro tem chair for the next meeting, maybe it's that person who will run that meeting who yeah. should be working on the agenda. Yeah, I agree with that. Because then, then really, they know they what's know going on on the agenda. agenda. Yeah. yeah. Is anyone is anyone interested in being pro tem for the next meeting? Pete, were you interested in that? I can do it. I'll, yeah. Is anyone interested in it? I'll throw a 
a great opportunity for people <laughs> to can lead the next one. Pete, I think Pete can, 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 can lead the next one. Pete, can lead the next one. Pete, you can make a motion for it? Yeah. Walk, like to make a motion hall. for Pete to lead the next one and work with the staff to establish the agenda. Yeah. A second. Second. So, okay, great. Um, all in favor? Oh, any point of discussion, point of clarification? Okay, and uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? Okay, great. Motion passes. Um, for committee meetings, do we want to have uh, that be something that we set parameters for scheduling now, or is that something we want the, the individual committee to do on their own? I would think so because I know we read the names, but um, I don't remember who all on the. We can do it all pull that. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, we can yeah. do pull the committees and come up with something that works for them individually. Uh, and we'll get that noticed the same way we do we'll set up agendas with, with the committee. Great. And then I would, would it make sense to say at minimum, let's have the committee's meeting at, what, at least every two weeks on the. On the, on the opposite week. So on the first and third week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then, and they're not necessarily beholden to that, but just at least. Um, that sounds good. Okay, and so staff will Wednesday. send out doodle polls with everybody to help get that organized. Um, uh, any other thing connected to scheduling? Jan, no, not please. scheduling. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't hear that. Piece. Yeah, the only, the next thing, the next item of business I was going to recommend. Yeah. Just something else to throw out there to think about with respect to scheduling is so you're you're identifying your regular meeting schedule, yeah. right? Which is great. Um, just note that you also have the opportunity if you wanted to do a, a special meeting, for example, right? So if you want to decide, hey, you know what? Let's do a Saturday all day and we can knock out a, a bunch of different things, right? You could do that as well. You don't necessarily need to schedule that today per se, but that might be another opportunity to knock out a big piece or a big, uh, a large amount of the training piece, right? Um, you know, so that that just moves a little bit, a little bit more quickly. So just a thought there as well. One of the clarifications here, um, Chair, um, are these dates permanent, second, or are we uh, are for now temporary? until we vote to change it? Okay. Is it are you okay with that, or did you want to be separate? February is going to be a problem for me, but I said that. But yeah. it, you shouldn't. Well, what are the, you can keep moving. Keep moving the yeah, what are the days you're available in February? I'm not available at all the first two weeks in February. I'm speaking somewhere almost every. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> so uh, February is out for me the first two weeks, but that doesn't mean that. We still can. Uh, you know, I, I do what I can. Yeah. Keep it moving. Keep it yeah. moving. But okay. that fourth Wednesday is fine? Fourth Wednesday is fine. The first two weeks are committed already in February. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we recognize that not everyone's, you know, yeah. we That's all have busy lives, not going to be able to be at every single one. And I think we'll just want to make sure that we're communicating to whoever the chair is of that meeting. So if anyone can't make the next meeting, uh, let Pete know. Um, Pete and Jason know. I think that was a recommendation I saw in here, I would suggest that we do that, um, just so that we know that coming into the meeting. And we can share input that same way prior to the meeting, you know, to make yeah. sure. Yeah, especially if you know the agenda. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Also, the beauty of your com uh, committee meetings as well, right? Exactly. So you would have put your input there exactly. and going forward. Not to mention, you also can record your, your meetings, too, so that if there's ever, you know, anybody who needed to miss, you can go back and watch. You just can't vote proxy. That's the only thing you can do. But you can send in, you know, statements or whatever. Yes. Um, I'm going to sit. Uh, can I? I just want to come Please. Yeah. With the committee meetings, we said first and third week. But were we saying first and third Wednesdays as well? No. Okay. We were just saying on the off week. Okay. Yeah. We're going to doodle poll the weeks and see what the best yeah. is for the students. Yeah. Um, another question? Go ahead. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so the next order of business that I was going to suggest is uh, having an interim executive director. Um, and I wanted to just suggest that we keep Jason on mm -hmm. as an interim executive director until we finalize the hiring, you know, open solicitation process. Is that a motion? Uh, I was about to say, I was, was going to make the motion. Oh. That wasn't it. Sure. Right. Would you I like to make, make the motion? Jason on. 
as an in interim. Is there, do you want to suggest the amount of time? I have no idea how long it would take us to find a little. I'll take a break, Shaima. I don't even know what you just said, but. Right. We've only said it. But if you are going to discuss um, the executive director interim, right, um, that is an employment decision generally. Or it is an employment decision, and that is an exception to the Open Meetings Act where you oh. can go into executive session to discuss that privately, close, oh, okay. and you can actually, right, you can discuss that. So that is an exception that um, you can move to go into executive session. Um, and to do that, you just make that motion, but okay. but the motion has to be specific, right? Okay. So it needs to say, you're moving to go into executive session, session to, to discuss, discuss XYZ. an employment okay, an employment decision. And then at that point, right, we all go. Right. You have a private conversation, right? right? Um, we, we cut everything, and then you vote to go back into open session, yeah. um, and then actually make the decision, right? Okay. So, so that's how that will work. Okay. So Thank you don't you. make the decision necessarily like you don't necessarily vote in in private, right. but you can discuss, discuss right. and then come back publicly. I think it's important that we do make that most of the day because Terry still has to leave. Right. Yes. And we need that vote. If I, if, so if I, I can a motion though, for but hold on, if I can though, <laughs> is is Jason still the executive director of whatever that title is currently, and how long does he have that position? So Jason, Jason is the administrative manager. So because the, because the executive director position is codified as actually in the charter language now, and it requires the commission to appoint or to nominate, and the, then the mayor actually makes the appointment to that, right? So So what that does is Jason goes by his classification, which is administrative manager, and the executive director seat is vacant. Understood. And so has that position been budgeted for or set aside in terms of the current budget that exists? So I think what I'm getting at is should the budget and grants committee meet first before hiring so we understand what our budget looks like if Jason, I mean, is still in the position to continue to help us as is. How, how important is it for us to make that decision tonight on an executive director position? So I would say... And this uh, is interim, too. This is not... Yeah, it's not... Interim. So, yeah. Temporary. But would his salary so, change? So right, that's what I'm... That's what I, I, it's, it's not about Jason. It's more so about now. budget for me. Right. That's, that's what it's... So, it like so, so they, they, are, they are intertwined, right? So there's, there's two pieces to consider. If there is... If you were looking to to have Jason be the interim, just as is, right? So that's just taking one of the staff that already exists and saying, no, okay, now your position is this, right? So that that requires no budgetary piece there, right? Nothing changes in that regard. Um, what would change is if you decided you wanted to consider someone else to be someone external to be the interim. Right. If you decided, hey, we want there's somebody else we want to be the right. interim, then there needs to be a conversation about what the budget looks like because now you already have staff that's kind of allotted. <laughs> and chair, if, if I may, I'll I'm happy to accept interim at the current pay. So all that would mean okay. is if you nominate me, it would go Tired before the mayor and, and they would just change my temp my classification temporarily to unclassified civil servant. If I were not to remain the executive director, I would then go back to, my, it's like the way they do with police commanders. So police commanders have their civil service rank, then they go to appointed positions and sometimes they go back to their civil service rank. So it would, it would be a temporary thing and I, in the budget discussion, I'll just, I'll just say I'm good with what I have right now to help you guys get going. So you don't have to overcomplicate that piece of it. Okay? Uh, if you, when you, when you classify this job and you work with HR and, and we'll help you with that. And if you want to post it in the future, yes, then we'll have to look at what you know the market value is, what salaries are, so it's competitive, right? But right now, if you wanted to move forward, I would be happy to continue at my current salary in that position. Do I ha hear a motion? Go ahead. I was gonna clarify. Right yeah. Because even with you continuing at the current rate, that's still taking money out of our budget that we had to review. Correct. Or is this a separate pot of money? So, so no, no. So there's there's no money thing that's happening. All that thing, all that, all this would mean is you're just giving him the title. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting well, paid said, already. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm, I'm getting paid already. So okay. that's right. it's already there in the budget to pay me what I'm being paid now. Right. So, okay. so he's yeah. not getting paid more. 
Um, there's no other transactional thing that needs so to that happen. So that number that we were given tonight in our budget, that will be the number moving forward, even with you being so the paid. Way, the way budget works understand. is right now, so that number is only, doesn't really exist yet until council says it exists. <coughs> so what council does is for the first three months of business operations, they release 25% of any given budget That's to keep it, keep it moving. So right okay. now we're okay. So if you wanted to change that salary, and that's why the budgeting committee is so important to work these salaries out and the staff positions out, we have to go to council and lock it in for 23, right? So we will have to consider what the future executive salary looks like either this year or whenever you want to do the hiring. So in one of these budgets, we will have to change that. And we'll have to figure it out if we want to do it this year before we go to council. And next fiscal year, the city runs on uh, June? When did the next fiscal year start? It start we're yeah. calendar fiscal year. Oh, so calendar January. fiscal year. Oh, yeah. okay. So it starts over each each calendar. Oh, okay. So we're not first twenty five percent. You and said so the you look, oh, huh? yeah. So the council already released this twenty five. That's what I was yeah. trying to figure yeah. out. Like, yeah. where is the money coming? Yeah. From? yeah. Okay. Kyle, you look like you had a question. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no. I'm in, I'm in favor of Jason staying on. I just want to so, make sure people get paid. Yeah, I, 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 a motion? I move that we move into executive session. Okay. Do I have a second? second. What's your question? Do we have to move into executive session if it stay? If the well, well, if, 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 you you, if, you, if you want to have a conversation, yeah. have, for the conversation yeah. that's just you, that, that me, Jason, all of us, we're, we're no longer in the room for. Yes, I think it is. I think it is. I think so, yes. Do I have a second? I second. Okay. Um, motion passes. So we're. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, um, motion passes. So we are now going into executive session, and then we will call you guys back in when yeah, executive yeah. session is over. Let me get the number. Yeah. So you may also want to think about that. Oh, no, they ain't coming back. They may also want to think about putting a time limit on being in executive yeah, session. Yeah. And for those who wish to stay uh, here in the building while you're in executive session, we'll be across the hall in the, in the lunchroom. So some of you are just somebody in the press. So I, I think that would be nice. Are you guys okay with that? Yes. Please stay. Yes. Also, would you like to sit at the table instead of... Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want... Here's some table space. I think I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking minutes. No, no worries. I'm going to take notes for you. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes, <laughs> Greg. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. sir. Because really. Okay. All right. I guess we're kicking you out. Thank you. That's fine. We'll kick you out. We'll come back. I'll make notes. Everybody leaves except the actual.
Be back online. So, so, one second. Yeah, we're on. We're on. Okay. Um, so I have no microphone. Mike, Mike, Cap. Okay. Are we good? My track. Okay, thank you. Um, executive session has ended. We are back in public meeting. And discussion has ended. Is there a motion that wishes to be made today? I to make a motion to um, appoint Jason Goodman as interim executive Is there a second? Okay, uh, pointed, I get, no, we already had a discussion, so we'll move to the vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? <laughs> abstain? I'm abstain. Okay, one abstention, that was John. Okay, and the motion passes. Uh, Jason is our interim executive director. Are, um, are there any other items for the agenda tonight? Please, Jen. <laughs> uh, uh, third. I, move to, no. No. I move that we establish a hiring committee. Do I have a second? A second. A second. Okay. okay. We'd like, uh, thank you. Your motion is accepted. Is there any point of discussion or clarification? I would like to, off, I can't, can I offer a friendly amendment? To, well, you go. I can. Okay. I meant that um, we need to have a committee for hiring and also Charles E. Yeah, and then I just wanted to say, let's. Does anybody want to be on that? I know I do. So. Okay. So, we have note of that. So Jan. Yeah. We're just doing it. We're doing it. It's happening. You don't know about. You can do it later, but I don't think we need to hold off. That shit's Why is it easy to create? Okay. I'd like to call order, and I would like to say that let's. I guess the motion stands, so the vote, the vote is up. The people who requested to be on it were Jan, um, John, Alana, Kate, Terry, myself, and then um, Charles is the head. I guess the committee is not really chair. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to make it clear that if people would like to join it later, they, that is absolutely open. Um, the motion has been made, so we will take a vote. So all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstain? Okay. Um, did Sharina abstain? And the motion passes. I heard a motion to end the meeting. I forget what the fancy word for that is. Adjourn. Thank you. Um, do I hear a second? Okay, second. So Jan, Jan motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Meeting ends. Thank you. Um, real quickly, real quickly, thank you all for... we have to go through to get that if you want it's here uh, you could come back anytime to get it uh, if, you, if you want to get out of here tonight I understand but they are here um, so but we do have to do some paperwork